All right. So good morning and uh, welcome to uh, lecture number three of a 12 lecture series to get you ready for the highest mark in principles of taxation. Um, so we've actually looked at the Ghana tax system in our lecture one. And in our lecture two, we actually looked at fiscal policy. So in this lecture three, we are actually going to talk about how tax is administered in Ghana. All right. So we look at tax administration. Now, when we talk about tax administration, um, what we are trying to understand is how um, the tax system is managed, right? How um, from the position of the laws being set and the intent of the law being fulfilled. So that is what we mean by um, tax administration. And so um, for this to be possible, it means that we need the tax laws. We need the tax laws. Now, when we have the tax laws, then we need those who enforce the tax laws. Because the tax laws, the subjects of the tax laws are the citizens. All right. Or let me say taxpayers. All right. So those who pay the compulsory contribution. Then we need the regulators. Right, those who are going to really enforce that the laws are in place. And you realize that in this case, we are looking at who the Ghana Revenue Authority. All right, so that is what we mean by tax administration. And so uh, when we talk about tax administration, we are talking about the administration, the management, the conduct, the direction, the supervision, and the execution. All right, and application of the internal revenue laws here in the tax laws. All right, so the tax laws or related statutes, maybe regulations and tax convention. So, how it is being made manifest. All right, so that is what we want to look at. All right, so in tax administration, these are the players. We are talking about the lawmakers, those who make the law, and those who enforce the law. So, those are what we want to talk about now. And so um, because of these, we are going to broadly categorize this section of our steady tax administration into two. We have, we will have on one hand the governance and on the other hand, what we call the elements. All right, now, so on the side of the governance, we are looking at the laws and we are looking at what? The Ghana Revenue Authority. So that is what we are looking at. Then on the side of the element, we are going to look at this acronym uh, FACA here. So we use F for finding the taxpayer. A for assessing the taxpayer. Then when you assess, you collect the tax assessed. Then um, uh, in terms of collecting the tax assess or the assessment, we also talk about what interest and penalties interest and penalties, all right? And A is for accounting, or you account for the tax collected. And R, we are looking at uh, resolutions, dispute resolutions, how disputes are resolved. All 
right. So these are the things that we are going to. So quickly, let's run into it and see how we can um, complete this section. All right. So first of all, what you need to know is that uh, before 2009, um, we had the IRS, the Custom Excise and Pre uh, Preventive Service, which we used to call CEPS. Then we had the VAT, Value Added Tax Service. So these were different um, uh, revenue collecting or administrative agencies uh, in Ghana. Then the late um, Excellency John Evans Atamels, our president, uh, uh, before he became, uh, I think he became president in 2000, yes, in 2008. Yeah, then in 2009, uh, he changed the concept of our tax and brought all of them together under one act called Ghana Revenue Authority Act 2009. All right, so that is that is what we have. Now, in the act, the very first section of the act talks about uh, the, the establishment of the body of GRA. All right, so that is how come we have GRA. GRA is, is a body established by law. All right, and it's a separate entity, separated. Um, here we say it's a body corporate with perpetual succession and has a common seal. It can be sealed or it can also seal. So you can take GRA to court. GRA can also take you to court under their corporate name. All right, so that is that. Now, why did he set up the authority, the objective, the reason why he did that? And the section two of the Ghana Revenue Authority Act tells us that he aimed at providing a holistic approach to tax and custom administration, a holistic approach. When we say something is holistic, it, it means that you don't start at one end and leave the others for people to continue. You do everything all together. All right, so that is that. So GRA, instead of having IRS to do some part in, in, for the same taxpayer, a taxpayer may go to VAT, a taxpayer may go to IRS for domestic. I mean, why don't we have a body that does everything all together for the person? And that is why he brought up uh, this um, holistic approach uh, uh, idea. So now, if you are paying duty, you pay to GRA. All right. If you are paying your income tax, you pay to GRA. If you are paying your VAT, you pay to GRA. So it's not like before when you are paying self, you need to go to self's office. When you're going to pay VAT, you need to go to VAT office and all those things. All right. So he brought them all together. Um, probably a way to downsize the government. All right. Because each of these three had their own commissioner generals. All right. So probably a way to downsize it. Okay. So another reason was to reduce the administrative and task compliance. All right, tax compliance costs because we all know about synergy. When they come together, they are able to do more than what each and every individual department or breakdowns could have done. So they come together, pull the resource together, and thereby provide better service to the taxpayers. All right, so uh, that is that. Then to promote the collection of tax revenue and equitable distribution of tax burdens to ensure greater transparency and integrity, of course. Uh, that was a major issue, especially the customs. And even now, uh, I don't think we've fully uh, been able to achieve that transparency and ensuring equitable distribution. Because there, you hear of the news of the things that are happening in customs. All right. So um, that kind of transparency and integrity, uh, he had the idea of ensuring that in, in terms of bringing efficiency in our tax collection, uh, the revenue generation. And, and I think now uh, things are being done straight to the consolidated fund. So a way to uh, even uh, progress in this area. All right, now, yes, also not just about uh, greater efficiency, we are talking about accountability to government for professional management of tax administration. Uh, before I have heard, that when you pay, it goes into the bank. It takes a time before the bank actually releases the money. Or if you go to the GRA office and pay cash, I mean, definitely the cash may end up in the 
government coffers, but it serves as a loan to someone for a particular point in time. Okay, so uh, these things, and also to promote information linkage. Of course, when they were separate entities, uh, information from one end to the other about the same taxpayer was kind of impaired. Now, it's the same GRE. So if you take me, for example, I have my TIN, and that thing runs across. If I do anything of VAT, my thing runs across. So there's kind of information linkage and information sharing among the divisions now. All right, to provide a one-stop tax uh, service for taxpayers for the submission of returns and payment of tax uh, taxes. And this, I believe that we are getting there, given the fact that we are using the Ghana.gov and the taxpayers portal. All right, so that's that. Then the this one talks about being able to provide a common procedure to en enable taxpayers uh, to be governed by a single set of rules. So not the VAT rules, not these rules, so separate and all those things. But now we are gearing towards that. We are gearing towards that. And of course, uh, provide uh, for matters that are related to the improvement of revenue administration. So that is that. And so these are the objectives. So what do, how do they do uh, how do they perform to function and achieve this objective? And that is this, you see the elements. Those are the things you see over here. All right, so what did they do? They identify, assess, collect the tax interest and penalties to the Republic. Um, they pay the money into the consolidated funds unless otherwise provided by any act. They promote tax compliance and tax education these days uh, we are at the voluntary tax regime, and that is a very key concept. Voluntary tax regime, uh, whereby uh, the taxpayer himself now sees the need to freely comply to the tax laws, all right? So um, all that the GRA has to do is to motivate this voluntary uh, compliance. All right, so to combat tax fraud, and evasion, uh, advise the uh, district assemblies on the assessment of, uh, because uh, on the assessment and collection of their revenue, uh, they, they really need that. They really need that. Uh, they, these days, uh, they also publish reports. I think the last one I saw was in 2021. GRE publishes report that is related to revenue collection, and they make recommendations to the minister uh, on any revenue collection policy, all right? And of course, in Ghana, any other function as determined by the Act. All right, so that is that is that. Now, what we need to look at now is the governing body of the Ghana Revenue Authority. You see, it's it is a body corporate, and every body corporate must have uh, some kind of board. All right, so there is a board for GRA. There is a board for GRA. All right, now the board for GRA used to be made up of 11, but it has been downsized to nine, all right? According to uh, the creation of the 791 Act 2009. So now uh, we actually have the chairperson. We have the chairperson. And yes, of course, after the chairperson, we have the CEO. And here the CEO is the one that we call the Commissioner General, all right, the CJ. Commissioner General is actually kind of the CEO of the Ghana Revenue Authority. He forms the second person. Then we have from these arms, number one, a person or a representative from the BOG, so rep from Bank of Ghana, all right? But this rep of the Bank of Ghana should not be below the, the, the rank of what? A governor. So that is what you see uh, below the rank of a deputy governor. So uh, not below the rank of deputy governor. Then we have one, two from the Ministry of Finance, another rep from the Ministry of Finance, that one too will not be below the rank of a director. You see, uh, not below the rank. Uh, if you check our public sector 
system. I think we have the minister, the deputy minister, we have the chief director. All right. So um, then also another one from the Ministry of Trade. Trade. So the Ministry of Trade will have the same, not below the rank of what? A director. So that is what you see. So Bank of Ghana, Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Finance, all right? And these form what, five. Then we have other four. Four persons from the private sector. Um, two, two of these four should be women, all right. And this is where politics comes in. Because all these things that you are seeing, all these people that forms the board of GRA are all appointed by the president. Appointed by the president. So uh, that is where politics is, is becoming the canker. All right. So the president, if you supported the, uh, the politics, I mean, the political party, then they just slot you in there uh, most of the time. Then that, that, that has been the case. Let, let's just be realistic. All right. That, that has just been the case. It's a reward for engaging in politics. So um, that is that. Then... So we look at the functions of the board. And I always tell people, board are mainly for monitoring and supervisory role. They are policy makers, monitoring and supervisory uh, people. So th those are the major functions, all right? So uh, for a function of the board, supervision, monitoring, all right? Performance, that is that. Formulation of policies, that is that. Then determining the scheme of work of people, okay? Determining the scheme of work. All right, and any other uh, any other uh, function incidental to the object of the authority. So, formulation of the policy, uh, monitoring and supervising the implementation of the policy, then uh, determining the scheme of work. All right. So, uh, and any other function. Okay. So that is that. That is that. Of course, the board makes recommendations to the finance minister in terms of anything concerning the tax policies. All right. Now, the division, as you see, uh, has it like this. We have the Domestic Tax Revenue Department, which we call the DTRD. We have the Custom Divisions. We have the Support Services, all right? So uh, these people deal with the import and custom and excise uh, stuff, all right? Then we look at uh, DTRD, Income Tax, and VAT. So uh, that is how it is now. So we have the DTRD which is mainly in terms, but in terms of money payment, it all goes to GRA, they are the matter. But in the, in the division, we have the DTRD, which, which is concerned with income tax and payee, uh, payee pay are all forms of income tax and what, uh, VAT. So you see the VAT that we used to have, VAT services is gone, all right? So that is that. Then we have the customs. The customs. The customs are for import and export and also excise. All right, excise. All right, so that is what happens. Then we have the support services. Of course, there has to be some people to take care of IT. There has to be some people to take care of HR, uh, accounting, all those departments all right so that is that there is a fourth one per the law uh, which is any other div divisions as determined by the parliament of ghana so take note, of that. take note of that now let's now go into the ceo the ceo um currently we have a uh, reverend uh, amisha dai as the ceo of gra um 
And per the same Acts 791, uh, make mention of the appointment of the CEO, which is the Commissioner General, who shall hold office for a period of four years, renewable for another period of what, four years. And he's appointed by uh, the, the president. You know that the president is voted in for four years and re-voted for what, maximum of four years. So uh, it goes along with the Commissioner General, all right? So that is that. What is our, What are his functions? Of course, he's the CEO. And per every function of a CEO, you are supposed to ensure the day-to-day -day administration of the GRA. What is the role of every general manager? The same role for uh, the commissioner general, all right? So if the, if the board makes a policy, he's supposed to carry out the, the spirit of the policy, okay? So uh, that is that. He reports to the board. All right, so that is it. So they perform any function as determined by the board, day-to-day -day administration, right? Of course, he may delegate, but once he's delegating, he's not relieved of the powers or the, the ultimate responsibility of it. Okay, so that is that. So these are pertaining to the Commissioner General. Now, in performing his function, uh, there are powers that he has, okay? Um, powers that he has. Uh, in, in, when I was in uh, undergrad, they taught us the delegatable powers and the non-delegatable powers. But actually, if you look at the law carefully, all the powers of the Commissioner General are delegatable, except that there are some that he can delegate to just the three commissioners. You see, uh, it, it, we, have, we have the Commissioner General, all right, on top. And Beneath him are three other commissioners, the commissioner for the DTRD, the commissioner for customs, and there is a commissioner for support services. All right, he is the general, commissioner general. So there are functions that he can give to uh, these, these commissioners. So this one is, the head of this one is a commissioner, the head of these ones do are commissioners. But especially when it comes to this, apart from them having a commission, they also have so many branches. See, right now we call them the tax service centers. So under every tax service center, it is headed by a senior revenue officer. Senior revenue officer, senior revenue officer. So there are some functions that this commissioner general can delegate to uh, these three commissioners but there are also others that he can delegate to these senior revenue offices. Because sometimes when you go to the offices at the various tax service centers in your location, you are going to meet the senior revenue officers, not the commissioners. These ones are usually based in Accra. I think it's the custom one that is based in Tema, maybe, but these ones are always in Accra. All right. So if you go to the Commissioner General's office, you see the offices to there, all right? Yes, you see there are the ministries, you see it there. Okay. Now, let's now go on to look at these, uh, uh, these powers or functions, all right? So that is that. Now, uh, this is what the law says. It says that without limiting the powers and the responsibilities of the Commissioner General, the Ghana Revenue Authority Act uh, opines that the CJ gives a written directive that are necessary to the administrative uh, and the implementation of this act. And we are, we are going to look at uh, some of the things that he does. And it must be pointed out that the function of the Commissioner General stated above, as enshrined in the act, are all delegatable. They are all delegatable, all, but only to a tax officer with the rank of what senior revenue officer or above, unless otherwise instructed by what commissioner general. So there are some that goes to the commissioners and there are some that goes to the senior revenue officers. All right. So we are in effect, uh, what the revenue administrative part is also telling us is that uh, the CJ may delegate some of the functions under section 14 of this act. Uh, the taxpayer shall not a tax officer shall not delegate function to any other person, even if the person is an expert or a public officer in terms of performing a function. Okay, so these are 
where he can delegate to. So we are talking about the exclusive ones. Let's first look at the exclusive ones. The exclusive ones are those that can be delegated to uh, only the three commissioners, all right? So these are, and as pointed out here, uh, allows him to delegate the power to only the other three commissioners. And let's look at them one by one. Now, now we have one, the power to grant extension, power to grant extension. Power to grant extension. For holding a, a document or seized asset. Seized asset. All right. So, what does that mean? Uh, let's go under the law. When you read section 33 of the Revenue Administrative Act, you realize that you see the Commissioner General actually has the power. He has the power to seize any document that, in his opinion, or uh, 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 in his opinion as the Commissioner General or any other authorized tax officer, uh, can be used as evidence in one, determining the tax liability of a person, number two, to show an offense that has committed by the person. So the document can be seized if it is being used in terms of uh, one, determining your tax liability, number two, uh, to determine any other offense. If that document is an evidence, then that is it. In the same way, he can also seize up an asset, can also seize up an asset. But under the confines of the law, the Commissioner General has the, uh, the power to seize these things for only up to six months, all right, six months. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the commissioners has the power to seize it up to six months. Now, the Commissioner General has now, by the law, be, is empowered to extend the time of the six months to another six months. So the total, the maximum that he can keep an asset or a document is now one year, but the law gives six months, but the commissioner general has the power to extend it to another six months. But it in total, it cannot exceed 12 months from the date that it was seized, from the first day that it was seized. So if the asset was seized on, let's say January 101, 2022, the Commissioner General can seize the asset up to 30th June 2022. All right. But the law empowers him. That is what we call the exclusive powers. It, it, the law empowers him to extend this six months period for another six months. Another six months. But this six months plus this six months together should not exceed what? Should not be greater than. So it should be less than or equal to what? 12 months. So it should not be more than 12 months, all right? From the day it was first seized, which is this day, all right? So it cannot exceed uh, 31st December, 2022. So that is the implication, all right? So that is the first one. Uh, the second one talks about uh, the power to remit penalty, power to remit penalty power to remit penalty. Now, uh, I have I've had this, you, you know about the amnesty that happened, that will oh, come and pay your liability, we will, we will forgive you of your penalties and interest, all right? So he has the power to remit a penalty. Now the word remit, if you don't take care, you think that he's sending money, penalty. No, the word remit here is used uh, to mean to forgive or pardon. All right, to forgive or pardon uh, a penalty, like the way I, I use the amnesty to uh, tell you. So if you pay your, your liability, the Commissioner General will pardon you, all right? Now, it has to be under certain grounds. What are the grounds we are referring to? So it says that the, to remit simply means to forgive or pardon, all right? So the Commissioner General can forgive you the tax that has been assessed, but only on the grounds that it is impossible to collect what the tax, the penalty. All right. 
So only on the grounds, but only on the grounds, only on the ground. But in terms of doing that, he may ask you to forfeit something. Okay, so where a person is liable to pay a penalty, the Commissioner General may refrain from the whole assessing of the penalty or in part extend the time of the payment, uh, remit or waive of the whole thing, all right? Uh, when they are doing this, they normally ask for something in return. And in, and those things are uh, kind of you paying your tax liability, like the amnesty one that happened, all right? So you pay your liability, you are forgiven of the penalty and the interest. All right, this, the third thing is to compound an offense. You see, the word compound too has to be explained well because at a glance, the first thing you, you think to understand is that he is doubling your offense. He's not doubling it out like the way you used to do compound interest and stuff. You know, that is not what it means. The word compound here is used to mean that to settle something amicably. Remember, we said that it is a body corporate uh, headed by this CEO. Uh, uh, governed by a board and headed by this CEO, who is a commissioner general. So it means that the, the body corporate can sue you, you can also sue the body corporate, all right? But the, the law empowers the commissioner general to actually uh, settle the things with you amicably, all right? In, in, in antithesis to you prosecuting or he, they prosecuting you at the court. But he does that for a consideration. He doesn't do that for free. All right, he does that for a consideration. Okay, so what the law says is that uh, a person who commits an offense under the law, when a person commits an offense under the law, the Commissioner General may compound, I mean, settle the issue amicably uh, uh, with the person and requiring the person to pay an amount specified by the Commissioner General, all right, or deliver up an asset for the forfeiture of the offense, all right, the penalty or the punishment in respect of the offense. However, this, this power has its limit. It has li its limit. Okay, what is the limit? If is that the Commissioner General shall not forgive or sorry, settle amicably an offense in respect of a conduct of a tax officer or a public uh, official acting in an official capacity or, or causing harm to an officer. If you are a tax officer, you collect bribe. It doesn't mean the Commissioner General has the power to settle with you. I mean, it's a bribe. You have to face the, the court. All right. Yes. And if, even if you are a taxpayer and you you I mean cause harm, all right. So you 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 actually uh, uh cause harm by let's say uh assaulting a, a tax officer. It's not a case of settle settling it. Uh, Amicably, it's a case of you being punished under uh, another law. Then we talk about the power of the Commissioner General to issue what we call practice notes and private ruling. All right, these are two key things: practice notes and private ruling. When we look at Section 100 to Section 102 of the Revenue Administrative Act 915, uh, that is where these ones are treated. All right, now the the practice notes is is kind of a document that explains the Commissioner General's uh, uh, opinion about the provisions of the tax law. All right, so that is what happened. So once the practice note is done, it is gazetted, it is published uh, in, in at least uh, two of the daily national newspapers. You go to the assembly press, you also get one. These days, it is also uh, published on the Ghana Revenue authorities uh, website, it is always there, all right? So that is the practice note. That is the practice note. Now, the, the reason why he issues the practice note is to achieve consistency. But sometimes there are ambiguities in the tax law and he sets his opinion on it and the, the, the citizens or the taxpayers can follow suit. Not only to achieve consistency, but also to provide guidance all right, to people who are affected by the tax law. I mean, the revenue uh, officers and also the taxpayers, all right, the taxpayers. And also to set out his interpretations in the provision of the act, as I earlier pointed out. But the key thing you should know is that the practice note is binding on the commissioner general until he takes it off, until it is revoked, all right? So, and it is not binding on persons uh, not affected uh, 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 by the tax law, all right? So 
that is that is that so it is binding on the commissioner general it is not binding on the person that are affected by the tax law what does that mean so if the commissioner general says that if kofi is going to school means tax is paid then whenever kofi is going to school tax is paid that is my understanding because the the that is the interpretation of the commissioner general and it is binding on him all right so that is that now he has the power to revoke it if he sees something wrong with it or amend any part of it, all right? Any material part of this come is, is amended. Now, so we say that the Commissioner General has the power to amend or revoke, or I mean, when we say revoke, withdraw, okay? So, uh, and must do so by publishing a notice in the Gazette and also on the authorities' website, at least also in two of the, the same way he publishes, the same way he can does his revocation, all right? So that, that is it. Now, if a new law or a practice note is inconsistent with the existing practice note, then what happens? The existing practice note is revoked to the extent of the what inconsistency. So if there was a if there was a, a one practice note that was there and a new one came up, the old one, if there are inconsistencies, inconsistency in the old one and the new one, what the law is saying is that. The old one is revoked to the extent of the inconsistency. Any other thing aside that inconsistency uh, stands. All right. So that is that is that. Okay. So the amended or the revoked part of the practice note uh, applies to arrangement that started before the amendment or the revocation, but not those what after it. All right. Take note of that. Now, the same way Commissioner General will issue a practice note, the same way you can issue a private or a class ruling. What is that? So if I want to establish a company, let's say uh, um, we know that uh, if you establish a business in Tema, Accra Tema, a manufacturing company, you are supposed to pay tax of 25%. Now in the same manufacturing company, if you are located in somewhere, uh, let's say Kaswa, and you see there is a there is part of Kaswa that belongs to the central region. But there is part of Kaswa that also belongs to the greater Accra region. So this Accra Tema concept. All right. So now the question is that if I am torn between these two and I don't know whether I belong to Kaswa or I belong to Accra, then I can go to the Commissioner General personally and say, please, I'm going to establish a manufacturing business at this social and so location. Is it under Kaswa? Uh, sorry, is it under Central Region or is it under Greater Accra Region? So that is a private ruling. I went there and he ruled. So he would tell you that, oh, it's part of Accra or it's part of what? Uh, Central Region. So he ruled. That is what we call a private ruling. I went there, I gave him the situation and he ruled. Now that is when I am one person. Person A. But if there are so many people who also want to establish the business and we all come together, so B, C, D, we all go together and go to the Commissioner General for such kind of a private ruling. That is what we call a class ruling. You know, a class action. So the same, that, 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 is, that is the same idea, all right? But here, you see the ruling on the, the ruling is binding on the Commissioner General with respect to the application of the law only the applicants. So if you are not part of the class action, the Commissioner General is not binding. And two, even if you are part of the class action and you lied, you lied, then it's still not binding on you. All right. So because you didn't expose him to all the, the true and fair facts for him to give you the decision. So if you say you were somewhere in between, but it rather turns out that you are actually in data crowd, you can't say the Commissioner General said because you lied. All right, so that is that, that is that. All right, then we have the power to exempt a person from withholding tax. What does that mean? Uh, I know you are familiar with it. So, <clears throat> uh, so some people, when you buy from them, you cannot withhold tax on them. Go to Kingdom Bookshop. When you buy things from Kingdom Bookshop, you may not be able to, uh, the that withholding tax. Why? Because the Commissioner General has exempted them from withholding tax. Okay, so that 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 is what we mean. So he give them what we call uh, 
withholding tax clearance certificate. So they are cleared of being uh, subject to withholding tax. So that is why. But he gives these things on reasons, on, on so certain criteria, all right? When you pay your taxes, okay? You should be somebody who pays his taxes. Your books of account should be proper, all right? You should be able to convince the Commissioner General that people deducting that withholding tax is affecting your revenue. It's affecting your revenue, all right? And even with that, you are supposed to provide the Commissioner General a filing document on those one that would have, I mean, open you to withholding tax. All right. So that is that. And this is it. It says that a person who is granted an exemption shall, at the end of every calendar quarter, submit a list of particulars of all payments which would have attracted withholding tax, but for the exemption. So if not for the exemption, you would have been subject to withholding tax. So all the payment that you would have been subject to withholding tax if the exemption had not given. Every quarter, you should file. Question, do taxpayers do that? So that is that. Then number six, the power to abate a duty. All right. So now, it said section 105 of the custom acts states that the commissioner general shall not, and this is it, shall not allow a claim for abatement of duty unless one, the claim is made on first examination of goods, the person proves to satisfy the commissioner general that the, the damage was sustained before the goods were delivered out of the custom control. So if I bring, I import, let's say I import a car and when the thing came to Ghana, some way, somewhere at the port, they, 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 they've, they've mistreated the car and it is, has caused certain damage. I have the right to ask the Commissioner General, please, since this thing happened under your control at the port, kindly reduce the duty for me. Let me use the reduced duty to go and repair the damage aspect of the car that you, you, you made happen under your control. And if you are able to prove that, then the Commissioner General shall assess the damage sustained by the goods and may allow an abatement of what? the proportion of the damage, all right? So that is that. Key point number seven is to determine any matter concerning the capitalization of profit and undistributed uh, profit of company. Now, we all know that when companies make profit, uh, what happens is form part of their retained earnings. What happens, they are supposed to what, pay dividend. But the habit of some entities are that they won't pay dividend. They rather shift part of these monies into capital formation, stated capital. How do they do that? They do bonus issue. They do right issue. So all these kind of things happen. Now, Commissioner General has the power to declare what we call deemed dividend. Deemed dividend especially when you're a closed company. A closed company is a company that has uh, a minimum of up to five members, all right? So deem dividends, he will force you and force you to uh, have an, uh, an amount to be paid as dividend and they will hold their tax of 8%. So if instead of paying dividend and the, the shareholder using that part of the dividend to come and buy shares, so that when he buy the shares, uh, there is an addition to stated capital. There will be stamp duty that has to be paid of 0.5%. Since you are kind of dodging all those things, then the Commissioner General can have the power uh, to determine a matter concerning your, your capitalization of the profit or the undistributed profits of the company. So he can force you and say, why am I using a moment your dividend my NG and withholding tax of 8%? by force. It about a boy Take it by force. We too, we are taking our our dividend or our withholding tax on the dividend. So that that is something that the commissioner general can do. And most of these GRA officers have been using this instrument a lot. Uh, question is that it is something that is delegatable to the commissioners. 
unless they can prove to you that it is happening or the commissioner general has otherwise delegated it so be careful all right so that is that that is that then we have the delegated power to the senior revenue officers of course one of those things is the power to extend the date of payment or vary uh, uh, and uh, tax by installment okay and it's something we will look at very soon uh, when we are looking at assessment now what happens is that you have let's say your tax liability you do your self assessment so you have your chargeable income uh, which is let's say 100,000 for the year then you strike 25% on this one meaning your tax payable let's say 25,000 what you do is to if you have somebody who pays tax by installment uh, you will divide this one by four. So now, if you divide the 25,000 by four, what do you get? You have 6250 to be paid each quarter. Each quarter. So, March, if your basis period is January to December, then you have March, June, September, and December. Now, he's saying here that the Commissioner General has the power to extend the date. So instead of paying this first one on March, on March 30, or let's say March 30th, 31st March 2022, uh, what will happen is that he can extend this date, uh, giving reasons that you are giving him, if it is reasonable, you can say, oh, don't worry, you can come and pay this one in May. All right. So that is something he can do. And he, he, he can vary the amount too, because uh, every month you are supposed to pay 6,000. He can allow you to pay uh, 5,000 and come and pay the balance in the next one. So you have 6,250 uh, and you paid 1,250 short here. And so you can add it the, to the next one that you come to pay and pay what, 7,500. So he can vary these things for you, all right? That one can be done at the various offices that you see, the senior revenue office, offices, all right? So that is that. Then we have the, the power to authorize an officer to access your books, records, computers, and this thing, you normally see them when they come to you for tax audit. So they are empowered to do so, all right? Then we have any other power other than those that uh, cannot be delegated as stated above. All right, so he can do that. All right, so that is it for the governance aspect. Now, initially, there would have been questions like uh, uh, the segregation of the DTRD into STO, MTO, and LTO. But you know, this system has been scrapped. Now, they are all called tax service centers. Okay, and it is based on geography now. This one was based on income levels. But this one is based on geography. Geography. So if uh, right now I am in Tema and I belong to Tema Community 9 Office Tax Service Center. In the same Tema, there is another one at Community 1. So geographically, uh, and when you go to Ashama, there is another tax. So geographically, every uh, place has their own tax service uh, centers. It's not based on your income level. So right now, it doesn't matter your income level. If you earn billions, I think this one had uh, from 500,000 to 1 million going, the LTO, then 200,000 to 500, just below 500, uh, you'll be in MTO, then uh, be, be below 200,000, I think what was the STO. But now it's not based on your income levels. It's just based on your geographical location. So it doesn't matter. And the, the, the good thing is that you cannot cross one office to go and register in another office. If per the registration document of your company commencement or uh, incorporation, if you are within a particular geographical area, that is where you be. B. All right, that is where you be. I remember I had an issue working for my former office 
And what happened was that, uh, and everything is now technology. The system is technological beings. Uh, my office file, the hard copy file was at, at, at one tax service center, but on the system, on their computer system, I was an ad, at another, so this is my example that I gave. So my company on the, on the system was under community one tax service center, but hard copy material, uh, my file was at community nine tax service center. And I had to write a letter to them for them to transfer it to the community one because the system give recognitions to what is the online, not the hard copy. All right, so that is that. Now, uh, we look at the elements, the elements, the element. Now, what are the elements? To make all these things function properly, what are the elements? The elements are that, one, we need to find the taxpayer. So finding the taxpayer. The taxpayer. How do you find the taxpayer? All right. You find the taxpayer by so many means. Um, Section 10 of the Act 915 um, gives the power to the Commissioner General to use two instruments, which we call one, the tax clearance certificate, and two, the TIN. The TIN as a means of finding the taxpayer. You and I will agree. And you know that these days your TIN is equal to us, your ECOWAS card, what we call Ghana card number. And, and how we arrived at this is also in the law. Uh, the law actually says that the Commissioner General can partner with any other agency uh, to help him in terms of achieving his function of uh, uh, locating or finding the taxpayer. So that's why they and the NIA has come together uh, to, to actually use the Ghana card as an instrument. It, it's actually in the law. It allows him so. All right. So a person shall, shall show a tax identification number, which we call 10, of the person in claim of uh, any declaration, anything, a return. That is your identity to the commissioner general. So without TIN, you don't exist, all right? Without TIN, you don't exist. And they've used this one to a large extent, tax clearance certificate. I will show you the uses of tax clearance certificate and how it is being used on a, as an instrument to get everybody to be found as a taxpayer. So look at this thing. Do you remember that about, I don't know, it's, it is from 2017, yeah, if I remember correctly, 1817. Uh, if you don't have a Ghana card, if you don't have a TIN, you cannot have a bank account. You can't. So it, they use the finance sector. Okay, so they join up with them. So without that, you cannot uh, 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 have a bank account. So it will force you to go and have it. If you are being employed, you need to have a tin. So if you want to be employed, then you have a tin because your employer will be punished if they don't have it. You don't have a tin and they employed you. So it's either they employ you and fast track your getting of the tin, or you have to get it. At the end, at the end of the day, you need to be a tin, and it's a good thing. Let's be frank, because a nation without identity cannot exist, and this is how we have to find our way of. Uh, uh, um, getting ourselves together and as our identity as a nation. And unfortunately, you see, politics is stealing good, good things that are happening in the country. So you are here in Ghana, you hear that the next general election that is going to happen in next year, 2024, they want to use the Ghana card, which invariably is your thing. And so uh, we all know that Ghana is owing the the and NIA is owing the company that is producing this thing, the card that they used to produce, you are still owing them, it's not being released. Uh, and there is also allegation that people are getting the thing who are not Ghanaians. Uh, for me, it doesn't matter if you're a Ghanaian or not. Um, but unfortunately, we will be in our nation, but some non Ghanaians will be deciding who to rule the nation for, which is very unfortunate. Other than that, look at US, for example. 
So the thing is that so far as you have the Ghana card on which is your tin, you have to pay tax if you earn income. So if you want to, if you want to be part of the selection of our presidency, then you also need to be aware that you will be paying tax. And if you are found wanting, the law should deal with you. So that is how we should see this thing. Not uh, uh, these politicians trying to use everything to destroy our country. It would have been nice, fine, you want to vote, but yes, you are a recognized citizen, you'll be paying tax on any of your chargeable income. So your right to contribute to our uh, selection of presidency is by you being found out to be paying taxes. So, so that is that. And that is what I think we should promote uh, as a nation. Okay, so your ten identification, you need to find in the tax taxpayer. Uh, we use the instrument of ten, and and the tax clearance certificate is a very key thing. And the last time I think I saw a memo that said that if even you want to renew your driver's licenses, you will need a tax clearance certificate. So imagine the big man, big man riding big cars. If you cannot get your driver's license or because you have not filed your tax and you are, your returns and you are not paying your tax, it's a good thing. You see, we want to push voluntary compliance. You should sit down and say, okay, and, and if, you've, if you've read the literature on the typology of tax compliance, you realize that the deterrent factor ranks on top. Because if I know that I don't file, I will not get my driving licenses. Then voluntarily, I have to go and file so that I'll get my driving licenses. Uh, so driving licenses is not the only thing, but I think it's a major one because there are these ones provided by the law. You see, uh, they are all in the law. It says that the tin must be shown in all documents in dealing with GRA to transact with who? Ghana Revenue Authority, Controller and Accountant General Department, Registrar General Department, this which we now call Registrar of the Registrar of Companies, the Land Commission. So I have, if you have a land, I have a land. If I want to tap into how um, I own it, then it means that I need to go and register it at the Land Commission alongside my tax clearance certificate. So this means that I need to file my taxes. It's a de deterrent typology. All right. Registrar of Certificate, Immigration Passport, DVLA, Court, MMDS, Individuals and Withholding Tax Agent. Now, watch this. The DVLA is one. This has been in the law since. Why is it not fully implemented? Court, Passport Office. So if you want to have a passport, which is another document that determines your citizenry, you have to show that you are a good taxpaying person. And, and, and that is the way to go. That is the way to go. All right, to clear goods of commercial quantities at the port or factory, uh, I mean, that one, I've faced it a lot working for companies. Uh, to register land titles, interest in documents, and we've said that to obtain a task clearance certificate, you will need a tin. All right, to register companies, you will need it. To receive payment from the controller and accountant general, you will need it. To even win a contract, uh, to, to be the contract, you need it and all those things. Now, how do you get this one? So you pick up a form at the, any of the tax service centers and you fill the form, all right? And when you fill the form, uh, the law says that uh, after filling the appropriate required form, the Commissioner General shall, within a specified period, uh, uh, issue you a TIN in 21 days, all right? So when you apply, within three weeks, you should have your TIN. I mean, this should not even take much time. But tin is not transferable. And you cannot have double tin. Unfortunately, we had a, a Reverend Minister in Ghana uh, in the name of Reverend Kusi Bwatin, who uh, has another name. And he has tin, two tins under each name. But he's the same person, uh, which is very unfortunate anyway, if that is true. All right. Then we have... Uh, the Commissioner General uh, says that the Commissioner General, as and when needed, can cancel the team. So in this case that we are having uh, with this uh, uh, Reverend Minister, if he deems so, the Commissioner General needs to cancel one of them, all right? Because 
when he sees it is fictitious or the thing doesn't reflect the identity of the individual to whom it was issued, he has to call it off. All right, so we have the task clearance certificate and the task credit certificate. You see, don't be confused. We have these two concepts as we have the task clearance certificate and the task credit certificate. What is a task clearance certificate? A clearance certificate says that you have paid all your obligation, or even if you owe, you have made an arrangement with the commissioner general to settle the liability, and therefore he can clear you. All right. Then we have the task credit certificate. The credit certificate is a certificate that you receive when you pay your tax. So it's a certificate of credit to credit your account. So when your office pay you pay, GRA is supposed to give you task credit certificate. Unfortunately, I have filed my taxes, but when I filed, it's on my platform that I'm owing GRA. Reason being that all the payee that my company paid on my behalf, GRA has not inputted it in their system. And these are tax administration. You don't need, you, you want me to voluntarily comply. But instead of the revenue officers also doing their aspect of the law, they are waiting for me to now write a letter to push them. Why haven't you done this? Why haven't you done that? And, and these are why people don't comply. Do your job since you expect the people to also do this. Unfortunately, I may have students watching this who are in the GRA offices. Please, you to voluntarily do your job. After all, that is why you are being paid by the taxpayer's money. So why should I pay your salary as a taxpayer? But you are not, you are there not doing your job. When my company pays my pay, you don't credit it to my account. Why will you do that? But you are preaching voluntary compliance. So please, uh, the CEO, uh, uh, Reverend uh, Amishada, if you can get this, uh, please ensure that in the day-to-day -day administration of the, your office, your officers get to do this for us because we want to comply. And if I have to now, I mean, uh, stress myself before they do their job for me to get my task clearance certificate so that I can use it for all the things, renew my driving license. So uh, do I have to go and fight them to do that before I can go and get my driver's license? So it's just unfortunate. So please, if the Commissioner General hears this, he should also help in this perspective. Because one of the things that we said about a good tax system, not only is it equitable, but there is convenience. There should be convenience, all right? So I don't need to take transport, go to GRI office, why have you done this? When you know it's something that you have to do. All right, so uh, that is the case. That is the case. All right. And I even heard that they are now pushing the uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants to uh, 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 to take the TIN or the TCC, because they already have the TIN. So they should take the TCC of their members. And before they can say the members are good members or members in good standing, then they should have tax clearance certificates. Okay. So these are the issues. These are the issues. Now, uh, it says that the Commissioner General, where, where he considers appropriate, may by notice in writing cancel a task clearance certificate. Why? If it, the, it's identified that the person has the task clearance, who has the task clearance certificate is, is, is using it or uh, is identified, the task clearance certificate is identified fictitious. Also, if it does not accurately reflect the true identity of the person it was issued to, also if the task clearance was issued to uh, issued has another taxpayer uh, to another taxpayer. So, uh, in these cases, he can call it back. Just ask the the uh, what do you call it the thing. All right. So that is the task. Uh, uh, what do you call it the task clearance certificate and we have the task credit certificate. So the credit certificate is what I explained to you. All right, so you go to pay the tax, maybe you withheld and you paid. All right, they should give you a receipt, which is the credit certificate, so that you give a copy to the person whose money you withdrew to pay the tax. So that person takes the copy and goes to GRA for it to be credited into 
is account, all right? So final tax, all right? When they withhold final tax, all right? So that is that. Is that. Um, so he uses the tax clearance certificate and the TIN, all right? Then another way they also identify the taxpayer is by tax type registration. What do we mean by that? There are so many tax types. We have personal income tax, company income tax. We have uh, VAT. We have withholding tax. We have payee. All right. All these things are tax type. So once you register, we get to know you exist. Now, in registration of these things, you have to, especially in a company, you have to submit the CV of your directors. All right, and give them your. Uh, these days, we the certificate of commencement is what they give. They don't give two; they just give one certificate of commencement. Once you have the commencement, it means you have been incorporated, and the registration is free. It's free. However, if you don't register, you can be in trouble because the law in section seventy nine of Act nine one five says that a person who is required to register and who fails to register commits an offense that is liable for a summary conviction of one, pay the tax payable under the law, two, pay a fine of not more than two times the amount that you, you, you are supposed to pay or a 1,000 Ghana seed. What does that mean? If you had to register and you didn't register, you are one going to pay any of the tax because if you don't register, it looks as if you don't exist for that activity. So the tax that you should have paid, you will pay. That one is one. Then what are we saying? Two times that tax. So let's say if the tax payable is 500, 2,500, which will give you 1,000, compared to what? 1,000 Ghana cities, the higher. So if in case, let's say this one was, let's see, this is equal. So you still be paying the 500 and thousand which will be thousand five in total that is what you pay so assuming the money is 600 cities you have you pay this one then you pay two times the 600 which is thousand two compared to one thousand and since this one is higher it means in total you'll be paying what thousand eight all right so that is that that is that now another thing that they use to find the tax payer is what we call return filing you file your return file or return. All these things that we are doing, bear in mind that it is highly examinable. So your understanding of it helps you. Now, it says that what is a return? What is a tax return? Now, a tax return is an official statement of information of the taxpayer. So a return is an information that you provide on the document to the Commissioner General of Ghana Revenue Authority. All right. So you provide information information that is that is basically it so uh, you get to understand the return is more of an information that you are giving to the commissioner general there are so many forms of the return depending on the tax type all right so uh and the third thing is the return so an official document on which you provide information to the commissioner general is what we deem as a return now on the return, there are some features that should that should be present, okay? There are some features that should be present and get to know that because they always ask that one, all right? Now a tax return is filled by the individual and is signed by the individual. So it means that you have a signature of the individual and also have a declaration of the accuracy and the completeness of the information that you are giving. So the return has your tin. You have your tin because that's your identity. Okay. You should have your tin. You should have your signature. I will, I will show you a typical example of a return. Okay. So that it doesn't become so abstract. All right. So that it doesn't become so abstract. Now, then you have what? Uh, uh, what we call a declaration. All right. Now, it says that the return is filled by uh, the entity. If it is an entity, it is signed by what? The authorized manager. So if it is an entity who is filling the return, it is signed by an authorized manager. If it's an individual, 
it is signed by the individual. Uh, the return has a date on it, okay? Uh, it has the period for the filing, period for the filing. It also may have, if it is any, it may have your chargeable income. All right, so uh, I will show you a return so that you see all those features very soon, all right? So that you don't memorize this. And once you see it, you know everything about it. The name of the company, the thing, and all those things. And it comes in your exams. So the Commissioner General by notice may require a person to file a return uh, before the filing date is due. Um, if he realizes that the person is going bankrupt, the person is winding up, or the person is even traveling indefinitely, about to leave the country, uh, seize activities, committed an offense that is taking him permanent, permanent prison, he may ask you to file a return. All right. So like I said, uh, the return, and for it says, Section 124 says that uh, a person shall file a return not later than four months after the end of the basis period. All right. Take note of that. We will look at these things in a tabular form for, for your help. All right, so you fill the prescribed form. It shows your accessible income, your chargeable income. Uh, do you have any tax credits that you have paid? All the informations, uh, I will show you how it looks like. All right, so all these things are a return. All right, a return. Now, uh, sometimes you may be asked to file a return, but you don't know how to do it. And therefore, you may need a tax consultant or anybody to help you filing your return, all right? In that case, section 29 of the Revenue Administrative Act 915 says something interesting. And this part is very examinable in your exam because people always go to consultants to help them file. It says the assistance in filing a return, a person who for remuneration, so, uh, and we are not talking about employee because I am a tax, certified tax uh, practitioner, and I work for somebody. So if I am doing it in the capacity of my employment for my normal monthly revenue uh, 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 salary, that is not what the law is talking about. But if my company now jump me to go and seek somebody else outside the company, I mean, people that the company don't pay salary to. So they go and seek like a consultant or something. That is what the law is referring to under section 29. So in that case, uh, if you go for that person to prepare or assist you to do your return, then what the law says is that the person, that person, shall specify the extent to which he has examined your relevant documents to help you determine your tax payable or your filing. Two, certify that to the best of his knowledge, the return or the attached represents a true and fair view of the circumstances. So he must certify that he the information that is there to be the best of his knowledge is okay, all right? So that is that. What if it is not okay? So that is the question. Where a person objects the signing of the tax return as required by that person, uh, the person shall submit, uh, shall submit to the other person a written statement why he's objecting. He feels like, no, uh, the thing is not correct. And sign the return, noting that the signature is subject to an objection. So he will attach his reasons of disagreement, which is the objection, but still sign the return to the person. All right. So the, the, the danger here is when the person throws it away. But anyway, that's why you're a consultant. You have to let the person sign a receipt of it so that in future, when they said you are the person that did everything, you tell them that I did an objection and this is the signature of them receiving that objection that I gave them. All right, so just be careful, just be careful. All right, so it says that it must be noted in session 30 that a person who is required to file a tax return uh, to apply to the Commissioner General for extension. I mean, this is what auditors normally do. Immediately they get your, they get to prepare your account and they are supposed to um, help you file your taxes, they will write an extension. Okay, so uh, the thing is that in Ghana, for example, if, if you are an individual, your basis period is 
January to December. And so therefore your timing of filing your taxes is April the following year. All right, the following year. So if these ones are 2022, then it means April 2023, you must file your return. All right. Now the law allow you to file for an extension for 60 days, which takes you to where? June, June 30th. All right. So that is on the grounds that your reasons are reasonable. The Commissioner General can uh, 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 allow for an extension. All right, so that that is that. Um, so it says that the C you the CJ may write and extend the date. All right, for you on a reasonable grounds for the extension. An extension may be subject to terms and condition, including payment of security. All right, uh, the CJ may grant. The CJ, the Commissioner General, may grant multiple extensions, but it shall not exceed 60 days, like I said. So the maximum they can give you is up to June. For the same for a company, same for a company. All right. So you have to note that. All right. So that is that is that. That is that. But another thing is what we uh, we see in section 31. Where a person fails to file a return on due date, the person uh where a person fails to file a tax return by the due date required by the tax law, the Commissioner General can appoint someone to do the filing for you if he deems so. Okay, so he will do the filing for you based on which he will determine your tax liability. Okay, but that filing that somebody will do for you, and this is it, it says that the tax return filed after the due date in a manner other than that one specified in the relevant tax law has no effect on the decision that the Commissioner General made by using somebody else to do the filing for you. All right. So they can up your liability or reduce your liability. It can happen. All right. So that is that. Now, Section 32 says that a person shall not amend or correct a return filed with GI. So, and that is the problem that. Has happened now. If you now file online, eh, it allows you to amend. But actually, uh, once you file, uh, you can't amend. So on the system, what the problem it is causing is that with this factor coming into play, if I file payee, let's say uh, we are in which month now, June. If I file payee for May, and I realized somewhere in August that, oh, the one that I filed in May was a, a mistake. The system allows you to go and pick up this May one and amend. But when you amend, it will still be the same here and create another one again. So it will look like you are owing money. And that is the, the thing on the platform. So probably they should check this. They should check it so that you are not able to amend, but you can do supplementary return can do a supplementary return because that is what the law says that is so the law says the person shall submit a further information supplementary okay so that is that is what you should be able to do all right and the benefit of filing is good it's good because uh, to the taxpayer it enables you to claim your tax relief after claim capital allowance uh so enables to claim capital allowance, to claim all your allowable expenses. Uh, it helps you to, uh, but, uh, the VAT registered person to claim his input VAT and all those things. To the Commissioner General, uh, so filing helps in claiming refunds and, and reliefs to the, all forms of reliefs and input VAT to, to the taxpayer. But to the authority, it gives them information. It helps them to know you exist. Okay. And it facilitates desk audit. Okay. So whether you are in business or you are not in business, they will know. I mean, and all those information they need to know about you. And this is a table you need to learn by heart. 
Filing withholding tax is within 15 days, not later than 15 days of, it says, fail, uh, filing withholding tax within 15 days after the end of each calendar month. So bear in mind, we are in, uh, we are in June. So by June 15, all with taxes with her in May should be, uh, you should file a return for that, all right? So in June, you file returns for May. The same for payee by 15th, within 15 days. So on 15th, so not later than the 15th day. All right, what about VAT? VAT is the last working day. People say at the end of the month, but please take note. The law says that not later than what? The last working day. The last working day of the month. Uh, following, so May VAT should be filed by in the last working day. What is the last working day in June? Let's find out. Let's find out. Take a look at the calendar pop up here. So the last working day in June is 30th June. So this one makes it look like it is the last day of the month. But sometimes the last day, uh, the last day of the month will be on weekend. But the law says that the last working day, clear day. All right. So take note of that. All right. Then we have. Um, it goes same with the when we say VAT, it goes along with NHIL and get fund and all those things. CST uh, is also the same. CST is also the same. Communication service tax is also the same. All right. Self assessment, not later than what the fourth month. So, uh, uh, sorry, it's self estimate. So, self assessment estimate is not later than the third month, right? But the filing of your final account is when? Fourth month. So that is PIT. But self-assessment is not later than the third month and the, uh, uh, in the commencement of the basis period. So let's say we are in January uh, 2023. We are in June now. So it means that by March, all self-assessment for 2023, March 2023, uh, 31st March 2023, all self-assessment has, has been filed. All right, so that is that. Then this is the one I'm talking about, filing of annual company returns and personal PIT, not later than the fourth month. Withholding tax is the same as payee. All right, so not later than the 15th month. All right, okay. So the payment and the filing goes together. The timing of those things go together, as you can see. All right, now... Payment of uh, quarterly installment. Uh, so payment of quarterly. Uh, so here we have not later than three months following the commencement of the basis period. All right. So quarterly installment is Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. All right. So take note of that. Take note of that. Then we have a uh, filing of excise. Excise is 21 days. So not on or before the 21st day. So uh, Exercise for May 2023 should be filed by what? 21st June 2023. So these are the things that you need to know. Then the last thing is the initial assessment. Well, when, when you now go uh, to GRA, um, identify yourself, they will do an initial payment on you. And that initial, sorry, initial assessment on you. And that initial assessment and audit involves um, them doing a provisional assessment on you. So sometimes your business is about to start, but you pay tax. You pay tax. All right. So they assess you, they let you pay something small. It will, it will, it will be for you at the end of the year when you, you have your account and you are filing. It is a tax credit for you. And it also involves audit. What is the audit? Them coming to see your office. All right. Where you are. All right. So that is the... First, the first 14 they do in terms of finding what the taxpayer. Now we know that the next one is assessing the taxpayer. There are two types of assessment. We have the self-assessment and we have the commissioner generous assessment. So the element number two is assessment. We have the self-assessment and we have what? The commissioner generous assessment. 
Now, the self-assessment is where a person who is required to pay tax by installment, um, you will file your self-assessment. I will show you how that one looks like. Uh, let me, and in your assessment, uh, let me quickly mm, take you to how these things are done practically. So you go to uh, the ghana.gov. You go there. All right, I think I have, I had something there that I was downloading. So uh, you can just go to uh, www.gra.forms. Why is this thing not working? My laptop is misbehaving. Okay, so it's coming. So I have one here. Let me just click on it. Oh, it takes me back to this same. So it's www.gra, you see, uh, it, it brings so many things here, but I want forms, dot. So you see the forms here, forms. So you click on that, all the forms are there. So what do I want to file? Uh, I'll go to, let, let me get one of them. Uh, download forms. Which form do I want to? So let's use a direct tax. You come here, you click direct tax. Uh, we are talking about self-assessment. So this is a typical example of self-assessment. So I will click self-assessment PDF. Okay, so this is a typical example of the self-assessment. Hope you can see my screen. So let me make sure you see my screen. So this is it, self-assessment. So, and you come here. So when they tell you that what are the features of an assessment, you, you these are the features, your, your service center, tax service center. So you see these forms are, you select your service center, you write, if it is TEMA, TEMA tax service center two, you put it there. Year of assessment is also on the return form. So don't look at this and go to the exams. They, they, they ask you, uh, what are the features of a return? And you have nothing to write. These are the features. Year of assessment is there. Then the basis period, so day, so here day and month. So 01, what? 01, you put there. To when? 31st slash 12, you put there. A currency, CD, you take. Company name, you put there. 10, you put there. So your self-assessment will now have your estimated chargeable amount, you put it here. Then estimated annual total income tax payable. So if you put, uh, let's say, uh, 100,000 here, and your tax is 25%, you calculate 25%. On this one, you have 25,000, then you put it here. Then it asks you, uh, estimate quarterly tax payable. So you divide it. I think when we did, we had 6250. So that is what you put. Okay, 6250. It says annual profit before tax. Now, if you have such information, you put there. All right. Yeah. So the, these other information, all of them are here. You put them. Uh, there are some. So there is the end. Uh, 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 if you have any foreign, if you have any other 
uh, tax that you are paying. So on the form, what you realize is that these names that they've given here, all you need to do is to go down. It's explained to you the, you see these things? Uh, oh, let me. It tells you your estimated annual levy payable. Did you see that? And uh, uh, all these things, financial sector recovery levy, the financial sector recovery levy you put there, if you are, that, those ones uh, affect your entity, you put those ones there. So that is that. Uh, estimated annual profit before tax, you saw it. So these ones, estimated annual levy payable, the national financial stabilization levy, financial sector recovery levy, all those things for the year that you have to pay. If it affects you, you put them there. Then we have estimated quarterly tax payable. You divide it by four uh, when you get all of them, put them there. So that is what you do. And importantly, you put your name, uh, you declare, so you sign and put your position. Then you sign your you sign here and the date of your filing. So don't sit in the exams. Let them ask you. Uh, so this is a self estimate, self assessment estimate form. Let them ask you features of return, and you are just there. You don't know what to do. I've given you a practical on hand example over there. All right. So let's go back to. Uh, let's go back. So that is that is the return, okay? For individual, if you are an individual, uh, you will choose you will choose the individual one. I hope I did not lose that thing. Oh, I did. Let's just go back and do a reopen close tab. So this is it. And as a matter of fact, uh, let me just uh, pin this one on my, my two bar. All right, so that it will be there. All right, so if I needed the personal one too, you can just go and select the personal one. So that is that. So all the returns forms are there. So I come here, instead of company, I look for, so you can even revise the estimate you Can go and revise. So personal income tax is here. So I have personal income tax self-assessment. So you can also revise. If you are revising, you use the new one. So you see personal income too is there. Let it finish loading. All right, so you see here, the same thing. So don't say you don't know the features of everything. So income from business, you slot. Income from investment, other income, you put them here. All right, so you put every information here. Employment, business, investment, all of them here. All right, so your total income will flow over here. Then your annual tax chargeable income, all right? So because you have to take away the reliefs, then quarterly, you divide them, all right? So uh, that is that. Your declaration and everything is done. All right, so that is, that is how the reforms look like, all right? So take note of that, take note of that. All right, so that is that. If you saw accessible income, you saw chargeable income. Uh, in estimating the tax payable, persons are taking into account any foreign tax claimed and uh, estimate of tax that will be paid in the year. Okay, so that is that. So self-assessment. So here, if your basis period is the calendar year, you know that your quarterly payment is what? March, June, September, and what? December. So let's work some examples. If it is not, then all that we are saying is the third month, the sixth month, the ninth month, and the twelfth month. The formula for uh, calculating your amount that you are supposed to pay is what you see is A minus B all over C. 
Now, what then is A? What then is B? What then is C? What is A? A is the current estimated tax payable under the law, all right, that you are going to be paying by the installment, the current one. B, that you are lessened, is the tax paid during the year of assessment, but prior to what the due date, prior to the due date. And we need to be careful of this. So uh, let's analyze this. Wow. So the tax paid during the year of assessment, but prior to what the due date for the payment of the installment, prior to the due date of, by the person by previous installment under section under this section. So, but prior to the due date, any tax that you have paid but prior to the due date of that installment. See, the due date of the installment were four, March, June, September, and December, or third month, sixth month, ninth month, and what, twelfth month. So any task that you pay prior to the next one, you need to factor it in there. B, tax withheld during the year, but, but what, prior to the due date, so the tax withheld but try, uh, prior to the due date from payment received of that person included, all right? Then C is what? Tax paid to the commissioner general. So this is one is the one that you yourself will pay, but also prior to what? The due date for the installment payment. All right, so that is also very crucial. All right, so that is that. Then what is C? What is C? C is the number of installments remaining. So installments are four. So if you pay, if you do one, you are left with three. All right, so that kind of thing. So let's look at this question. Ukwama limited estimate tax payable of 400,000 at the beginning. There were no revisions. So it means that this man, uh, 400,000 divided by four, which is 100,000 per quarter. So it means on uh, March, June, uh, September, and December, he'll be paying the 100,000, 100,000, like you see. But it's, you see the way we do it, 400 minus zero, because there is no prior one over four. Then second month will be 400 minus this one that he has paid, all right, many C is three now. So you see, in the third month, he has paid one, two, you take off. Then in the fourth month, that is what you do. But let's say he revised. So you see, see this example. Positivo limited as a tax. So let's open a fresh page here. So, um, he has a tax estimate of uh, 100,000. He filed it on February. Remember, the deadline was March, 31st March. So he filed it on February, and the entity revised it in 15 July. 15 July. All right. So the tax credit that he also had from withholding taxes. So what will happen is what you see here. So Q1 will be what? The 100,000, did he pay anything in the Q1? We have one and two. So you minus what? 2,000, 2,000 plus 6,450, all over what? Four. And that is what you see here. So when you do that, you have 22,887.5. So that is what you see. Then Q2, you still have the same 100,000. Don't forget, this one is in Q3. Q2 is in June. So you have the same 100,000 minus these ones that you did. Is there any other payments you did? No. This one is in May. Okay, so May is within the Q2. So plus 15,000. 
all of our three. So that is what you see in there. So if you do this, we have to combine it. Uh, I have 100,000. You do this, then you divide it by three. What I am getting is two, uh, let me see, I have two, five, five, one, six, unless I punched it wrongly. Because here the figure is different. You see, all over this, this one two is added. So yeah, I think that is the mistake I did. So pardon me on that. There is this one that has been paid. So two two eight eight seven point five, all over all three. When you do that, you have seventeen eight eight seven point five. All right, so that is that. Then Q3, don't forget, Q3 is when they revised it. So it will now be 120,000 minus all these things, including this one. All right, this one is in last Q. So that is what you see. That is what you see. All right, so that is that. Then the last one, you take still 120 because that's a new revised figure. You less everything up to this point and also less than November 1, 2. This one, 555. Five, five. All right, so that is what you do. Okay, so you get your figure. The same thing happened when you revise downwards. It doesn't matter. So you see it's 100,000, they revise it to 90,000. So you go the same way. First, you take the payments that have been made in the period, you deduct, you get this. Second, Q2, you, you add this one, this one, this one, and deduct from 100,000. Then the Q3, where the change made, you start with 90,000 and you deduct one, two, all right, plus all the payments. So this one, one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four. You deduct all over two, the time remaining. Same here. It's just that there was a November pay, payment of what? Uh, 555. Zero. So you do that one, divide by one, that is for you. So that is how you do your assessment. So we talk about a uh, benefit of assessment. Uh, that is what you have. Um, it's a necessary tool for voluntary compliance to assist the taxpayer in management of their cash flow. Uh, GRA is saved from the administrative uh, 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 cost associated to do their uh, commissioner general's assessment because they will have to print it and all those stuff. But these days, I don't think they need to print. They just have to upload it on your platform. And every day, since you are an accountant and you are face to face with your platform, you have it. So they don't need to print it. It's just so we need to change our law to with that statement of the commissioner general in writing. We need to change all those things. So I think perhaps I need to do an article on that. Uh, and, and, and yeah, I think I need to do something on that. So I will write it down and work on it. Because that, the Commissioner General shall in writing, shall in writing. These days can be an email uh, and on your platform, on your platform. Although the, the law defines, uh, brings technology in defining uh, notices is there in the revenue administrative act right. but those ones that go specifically in writing and all those things that is why they still print those things uh provisional assets you be there they call you please your letter is with us come and collect all right so to build trust between gra and the commissioner uh the the taxpayer sorry all right now let's look at the commissioner general's assessment so the commissioner general has about four types of assessment uh, that he does. So other than you doing it yourself, the Commissioner General can do it for you. All right. And that one we have this same assessment. When the Commissioner General does it for you, we call it what? Provisional assessment. So we are looking at the CJ number two, the CJ's assessment. So that is that. Okay, when he does it for you, it is called provisional assessment. All 
All right, then we have preemptive assessment. Preemptive assessment. What is a preemptive assessment? Now, if the Commissioner General has the hint that you are going to leave the country, you are being prosecuted, you are going bankrupt, and all those things. The Commissioner General um, can assess you preemptively. So by force assessment, he will do it on you and, and using his best knowledge. All right, but you see, it's a provisional assessment. Only that it's a it's preemptive. You are doing it before the thing, the due date of the thing happens. Why? Because number one, the person is leaving the country indefinitely. The person is about to cease business. The person is is being prosecuted and is about to go to prison for a very long time. So he will preemptively uh, assess you for tax. And these three conditions, please, you should know them by heart because it's examinable. I said what? Leaving the country indefinitely? Prosecuted and you are going to prison? You have committed an offense, you are going to prison? And what again? Uh, you are about seizing activity of your business. So all those things, you will do it on you and you have to pay the tax. And once he does that, uh, and you, you are not paying, you can lay hold on a security on you, like seize your asset or kind of thing, all right? Use your asset as a security. So that is what we are talking about. All right. So you will do that on you. A tax paid in respect of preemptive assessments is credited against the tax payer, but with respect to self-assessment, that covers the same word, period or event. So that is that. Uh, then number three, we have adjusted as assessment. So if the commissioner general does a, whether a preemptive assessment or a provisional assessment, and he finds out that, oh, probably the information that he used to do the assessment was shorthanded and new information has come to play, he can adjust this assessment that he did before because of the new information that he has. Then this one is the one that you know, final assessment, uh, when they come to do audit, they will give you a notice of assessment. So this one is the one after an audit. All right. So we call it a notice uh, task decision. Task decision. All right. So take note of that. Now, and that is the one you see the date and all those things, the time, your office, the CJ's assessment, and all those things. As for these features, please. I showed you how it looks like, okay, on the on the internet. So you, you should know that. Now, the issue is about, you see, one of the elements of the FACA in the assessment is dispute re resolution, the R, all right? And that is what is chipped in here to deal with, the R. So we are talking about objection to a tax decision. Now, if they serve you a notice, which is section 41, you are under uh, section 40, you are uh, required under section 41 to object it. So if they serve you provisional assessment, let's say uh, they will serve you uh, provisional assessment or uh, uh, typically, let me use, uh, what do you call it? Uh, provisional assessment on you. You are, Supposed to object if you don't agree with it, all right? If you don't agree with it. So if you don't agree with it, what do you do? You raise an objection. So we have the administrative procedure and we have the uh, uh, judicial procedure. So the administrative procedure, you write to the commissioner general. So notice in writing. Make sure every writing that you do, there is your tin number, your tin on it. So you write to him objecting, and you have 30 days to do that. 30 days within uh, the date they serve you the notice. You have 30 days to do that. Of course, if you feel like you can't respond to them in 30 days and you need extension, you can do also apply for extension. So the extension uh, should be prior 
to the end of these 30 days, you write for extension for another what? Uh, 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 30 days. Okay, so that, that is that. So before extension of the 30 days, you can apply for an extension on a reasonable grounds and the Commissioner General may grant you that extension. All right, now, if you want your objection to be heard, and this is where the issue is, and your objection is concerning uh, cases of uh, import duty, okay? Uh, so if it is import duty, or probably, uh, what do you call it? Uh, so in the case of import duty and taxes, you have to pay all your outstanding taxes, all outstanding taxes. And this has been examined before. I will show you very soon. You pay all your outstanding taxes and you pay full amount that you are objecting. So that probably when you win the objection, they will refund it back to you. But we all know they will not refund it back to you. So that is it. But apart from import cases, uh, any other case, you will pay all your outstanding taxes and you pay what? 30% of the current one that you are disputing. All right. So that is that. And once you do that, you give them the go ahead for the Commissioner General to act. So the Commissioner General's action may come in various ways. What is his action? Action number one, what do you do? And I see he can waive it, he can vary it, he can suspend the entire money, all right? The, uh, 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 this one, can suspend all these ones, all right? He can also waive it, I mean, reduce the amount, all right? So that is that. Now, the Commissioner General shall consider uh, this in trying to maintain his integrity. So, not necessary that you have to pay all these things by force, by force, by force. But he can, based on his integrity, reduce the, the amount before he considers your objection. Or even your objection as a whole, he can reduce the amount or he can also vary it for you. He can even decide not to charge you again. All right. All right. So that is that. Now, uh, if... Uh, if you don't object, then it means the tax decision is final. You have to pay. If you don't do that in 30 days, then it means it's final. You have to pay. But uh, the thing is that uh, he has to respond to you. Uh, the, the Commissioner General may vary the tax decision in whole, in part, or disallow the objection. Please bear in mind that the waiving or the varying of the suspension is to this one above, this one here. Suspend the above. He can decide not to collect anything at all before he takes your case. You can write to him for him to vary. You can write to him for him to waive it off or suspend it at all. But concerning the main tax decision that you are objecting, this is what he has. He can, he can also vary it. He can also disallow your objection. But he has to respond to you in 60 days. So if he doesn't respond to you within that 60 days, the law says that where the Commissioner General does not serve the person uh, 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 with the notice of his tax decision within that 60 days, then, then the person must elect to treat that silence of the Commissioner General as a disallowance of his objection. So one thing in kind, just one farm mount. And therefore, you can take the next step. Now, when you, when you assume his silence of 60 days on response as on for objection, um, on TO objection now, or he, he doesn't, he did not mind you, then you have another 30 days to, I mean, uh, go to the next level. Under the, before amendment of section 44 of the 915, the next level for you was to go to the high court was to go to the high court. But now, Ghana has established a tax court. So if you have an objection where the Commissioner General did not mind you, the next thing is to go to the tax court. Bear in mind, you cannot jump this administrative procedure and go to the tax court. You have to pass through the first administrative procedure for to go to the so if in 60 days you did not hear from him and you two in the next 30 days, you don't go to the next level, 
then it means you are also you have also accepted his decision. All right, so take note of that. Then you go to the next level. The next level is the amendment of session uh, 44, which came in in 2020 when the COVID was that much. Uh, you rather go to the independence appeals, tax appeals board, and, and that is that. And these days you need to understand the tax appeals board, the composition of the board. It's very, very interesting. So they also, they have a chairperson. And this chairperson <laughs> is interesting must be what a chairperson of not less than 10 years experience of tax practice who is a lawyer so that is why these days you see plenty of people doing law 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 the tax people are doing law so you have to have 10 not less than 10 years of tax practice and not less than 10 years of tax practice means that you are part of the CITG membership all right so and you are a lawyer Okay, so that is a lawyer of not less than uh, uh, 10 years in, in standing with the Ghana Bar Association. Or you can scrap all these people and just one retired Supreme Court judge solves the problem. So it's either you have a person who has been a lawyer and who has practiced tax law for 10 years. A lawyer, 10 years, tax law, 10 years. Or scrap these ones and use a, a, a former or a retired Supreme Court judge. Then, so we are talking about it's either 10, 10 years of lawyer, 10 years of tax practice, or retired Supreme Court judge. All right, so that is that. Then we have two people two officers from the GRE, two, two from the GRE, who are, whose rank does not go below chief revenue officers. You remember the senior revenue officers thing that we built. So two of those people, all right, two of those people who qualified for appointment as task consultant. And to be a task consultant, it means that you have to be a member of CIT. So that is that. Then apart from that, they now say two other members with the same qualification from here, from this place. So another two, same qualification from these people. So it's either you have two people who have this one or another additional two Supreme Court judges retired. Then now come to ICA, you have two members, all right, two members, who are part of ICA uh, 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 with not less than 10 years of practice and another two from the CITG, all right? But if you look at these things carefully, CITG runs here, CITG runs here, CITG runs here. So it means that you have to be a CITG, all right? So that, that is that. Then any other two representation from the private sector who are ladies. So we have two, 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 six, eight, ten, and what? Eleven. So eleven members of that board. And and to get to the chairperson, you have to pass through the executive secretary. All right. So uh, that is that. You have to pass through the executive secretary, who takes all your information. And, and the burden of proof is on the taxpayer. You are supposed to prove that the commissioner general is doing something that uh, you think that it is not in the scope of the law. All right, so that is that. Then, so we have, uh, it must be noted that an appeal against the CJ shall not operate in suspension of the objection. So even though you've taken them to court, you still have to honor those things, all right? So if you are to pay the money, pay the money. It's just that, uh, the the case is being decided still so that you can reclaim your money back. A person may at any time withdraw an appeal before a tax decision is made. Now, if you go there too and it didn't, you were not still satisfied, then you can now go to where? The court. All right, you can go to the high court. All right, so that is that. That is that. 
What is a back duty audit? A back duty audit is where there is a doubtful claim of capital allowance relating to a previous or a current year audit. So now they find out that you falsified something and you had a capital allowance. They can now what? Come back, all right? And when they catch you that you really falsified, you are going to be penalized or you criminal in, uh, institution uh, proceedings can be instituted against you. So take note of that, please. This part is highly examinable. The objection proceedings is very highly examinable. So please take time. If you have to watch this video back and back and back and forth again. Ouch. All right, so that is that. Now we come to application of a tax refund. Let's say you have overpaid the commissioner general and now you need your refund. What do you do? You have to apply. And a person may, uh, within three years of the relevant date, that the refund applies to. Apply to the Commissioner General for his excess, all right? And you have to use the right form, okay? You have to use the right form. Now you, you apply for the refund in writing, containing explanation about how the excess came about and the evidence that supports your calculation of the excess. Now, if uh, uh, in trying to determine the, the relevant date, it says in this section, Relevant date means that the event that gave rise to the payment of the excess, all right, that date the event happened, okay, that date. That, so when we say three years of the relevant date, it's three years of either the date the event happened or, or see, the word is the later of or the latter of, all right, the date on which the tax return is filed by that person in respect of the tax payment. All right. So it's either the date of the the letter of the date of the event or the date the person actually filed the thing in respect of the payment or the date he actually what made the payment. All right. Date of payment. So the latter of these three. All right. So that is that. Now, once you you apply, then the Commissioner General is bound to make a decision on your refund. Okay, so the Commissioner General must review and make a decision within what, 60 days, 60 days. Now, the Commissioner General has the authority to either reject the application if he believes that there is no excess or approve if he believes that there is an excess. All right, but the key thing is that if the Commissioner General is not convinced that the excess has been paid, then can request an additional information for him before uh, for for him to be able to make the final decision now the commissioner general is required to provide a written notice of their decision within what 30 days of making it all right so 30 days now it says that in the case where the further information is requested the commissioner general must consider uh, reconsider the application and serve a notice of his final decision within 60 days of the receipt of the original so these 60 days so you cannot say you wanted additional information and therefore the time is being extended. No, it still starts. So if you want additional information, ask it fast. Now, when they now realize that, okay, indeed, there's a refund to be paid, all right, then they have to pay. But the refund is first, the excess is first applied on any other tax outstanding for you, all right? So they will knock off. Then the remaining will have to be paid to you, um, within 90 days of the decision. Okay, so that is that. So if the Commissioner General agrees for the refund, the excess, uh, the excess, the tax or the refund must be provided regardless of whether the person files objection or not. So it has to be provided. Okay, so where the Commissioner General actually fails to uh, refund the excess within specified 90 day period, they are liable to pay interest. Commissioner General is liable to pay you interest. The interest is calculated as 50% of the statutory rates applicable to the earlier of the date the refund decision was made or the date the person filed the objection against the tax decision. So the earlier of the two, all right, the, the, the earlier of when, number one, we have the day the person files the objection, uh, number two, the date the refund decision is made. 
So the refund decision is made to the by the Commissioner General and the date the objection to is valid. The earlier of the two, you calculate 50% of the statutory rate. Statutory rate is say is uh, is 25%, then you calculate 50%, which is 75%. Then you apply the timing, which is the earlier of the date the objection was made or the date the tax refund decision was made to the taxpayer. All right, so take note of that. Take note of that. Then if the person has paid interest under that tax law due to that late payment, it is later determined that it was not payable. The person is entitled to a refund of the interest along with uh, the interest provided in point four. So he will collect the interest that you, the GRA, you made him pay. At the same time, an additional interest of the amount if you delay over 90 days. So in the case where the Commissioner General mistakenly refund tax, they have the authority to recover the tax. So it's as simple as that. All right. Now, uh, we want to look at the very last aspect of this, um, of this one. So we want to look at interest and penalties. It's a long video because tax administration is a very long video. All right, and I don't want to break it into parts, so we move along. So you have to patiently uh, watch all these things over and over again in terms of uh, dealing with uh, tax administration. Okay, so we will look at the interest, but I think because uh, it will be nice to um, deal with this aspect in return with the uh, what do you call it, uh, with the past questions and also uh, the other side of tax administration for uh, the level 300, uh, the level three, I think it's best we end the part one here. But before I go, uh, the next time we'll be looking at the interest and penalties. Remember the whole thing is what? Elements, the elements we have looked at finding the taxpayer. We are looking at assessing the taxpayer. So we are left with the interest. We will look at collection, and we've already looked at this. So we've looked at this. We are here, and uh, the next one that is uh, mostly purely for the level three hundred, uh, the level three. Although uh, the penalties, all right. Oh, better still. Let me handle the penalties to probably conclude for the level two taxation. All right, so let's look at interest and penalty. What you need to understand is that they don't mean the same thing. All right, they don't mean the same thing. Now, what is an interest? Interest is on money. Penalty is on offense. You need to understand that. So we say penalty is compliance to, all right? So if you don't file your returns and stuff, you pay penalty. But if you fail to pay an amount, you pay an interest. Okay, so we are talking about non-payment or short, short payment. That is for the interest, understand that. And the penalty is for what? Non-compliance of returns, all right? So um, understand that. So if you don't find your return, file your returns, you pay penalty. Uh, if you don't do it on time, you pay penalty. If you fail to make payment or you short pay, pay interest. And let's look at the first one. The first one is section 70. Section 70, um, it talks about interest of underestimation. So we all know that you need to do self-assessment, but people want to do a small value self-assessment so that they pay very less for their installment. Be careful, because the law says that uh, if, if your assessment that you see here, or even including your revised assessment, of the taxpayer for the year is less than 90% of the correct amount, all right? Then it means that the tax uh, payer is liable to an interest of 125% of the tax rate compounded monthly. And we will look at the compounding formula, all right? But it is applied on the difference between the 90% of the total amount uh, that would have been paid by way of installment. And the extension uh, or there is a note that you need, if you extend or there is suspension, it's ignored. 
is ignored. Take note of that. The correct amount refers to the actual amount of tax that you have to pay. Let's use the computation. Uh, it will help you understand this. So here uh, we have NAB, uh, who has his tax affairs. The tax paid on assessment is 1 million. Chargeable income is what? This is a self-assessment. Tax paid is uh, 1 million on self-assessment. Chargeable income is 4 million. Actual returns submitted says the chargeable income is what? Uh, 600, 6 million. And the correct amount then is what? Uh, thousand five. So you see here, so what you do, you see you compute 90% of the correct amount. The correct amount was 1.5. You compute 90% of the correct amount. This is what you have. Then let's look at the amount of tax on self-assessment is 1 million. So you see 90% and the 1 million, there is a difference. So the difference is the underpayment, which is this. Now the compounding formula is something that you need to understand. Uh, the compounding formula is this. That is how you calculate your assessment. Now it says that what is A? A represents the new principal amount. B represent the original or the, uh, the P is the original initial amount. What is R? R is the annual interest. What is N? The number of times the thing is compounding in a year within the 12 months. So it's always equal to 12 months because the law said compounded what? Monthly. 125% of the statutory rate compounded monthly applied on the difference between the 90% of the correct amount and the self-assessed amount. All right, so that is that. Then T is the number of years. Now the law says that where this section applies, the taxpayer is liable to pay tax. And the date is what you need to check. Is the date of first installment of the accessible year. So if your, and this is the key, if your basis period is January to December, then it means that the first, the date. The, the date of your first installment is what? 30th March. So take note of that. So that is that. And that is from that point to the due date which a person, which the person files return, all right, under the year of assessment. So the due date of return here will be 30th so if this one is 2022, due date is 30th of April, 2023. So if you actually count from here to this place, how many months is that? So it's kind of, you are starting from first April, another April, which is in total, what, 13 months. But if the person actually uh, files somewhere earlier than this, then you come from here to the earlier date. All right, to the earlier date. Let's now take an example. So this is this is it. If an accounting year is that if it ends in 31st December, it will be from March to what? April. All right. So so April the next year. So that is what I've explained to you. All right. And it says that NB points should note that the points should should be read as the earlier of the due date and the date what? It actually, and that is what I'm trying to explain to you. That is what I just tried to explain to you by telling you that you need to be careful of that. Uh, So even though it's this, if the person actually filed the thing in, let's say, 28 February, 2023, then it means that it will be how many months? Uh, it will be 11 months. So take note of that. So uh, that is what NT, you need to take note of that. All right, let's look at the figures and see how it is. Down. So let's take Kofi and Sun uh, Limited. Um, so Kofi and Sun Limited has this information that you see. Tax paid 
payable, actual is 200, estimated is 100, assume statutory rate of this. So what is the correct amount? The correct amount is the, the actual, 90% of the actual. So uh, correct amount, the amount that he, he was he actually supposed to pay is 200,000. Then the 90% of the 200,000 is 180, right? Good, but how much did he estimate? Estimation is how much? 100,000. So it means that the underpayment is 80,000. All right, now we know that entities are supposed to pay tax by installment. Okay, so that is that is the, so you will divide this thing by four, which means every quarter is supposed to pay tax. And that is what you see here. So it means that the Q1 penalty, this is the formula that you see, all right? So we said R is what? 125% on the, on the rate. So 125% of the statutory rate. What is the statutory rate? It's 20. So you calculate 125% of that rate. You get another rate. And that is what you see here, R. So that is what you see. 125% of that 25, 20% gives you 25%. And is the number of times the thing is compounded monthly. And like I said, it's a basis here, it's 12 months. The time, the time here is the time. So it's this one, the question said what? 2017, and he did it on April 30th, the next year. So you count 13 months, 13 months, all right? So that is that. 13 months. So that is that. Then P, the amount we are looking at is the quarterly payment over here. So each quarter you calculated, you calculated. So let's take the first quarter. So it means when you are counting Q1, will be 13 months. Q2 will be how many months? Uh, it's 10 months. Q3. You'll be calculating it on how many months? Seven months, right? Then Q4 will be calculated on how many months? Four months. All right, so that is that. Now, so that is what we do here. So if you now bring it inside the formula, you have to express this thing in terms of 12 months. All these things has to be expressed in terms of 12 months. If you want to express this one in terms of 12 months, you have 13 over what? 12, all right? terms of years. So you see here, so this one actually cancels this one out. So you raise to the power 30. That's what you see, NT. So the N is expressed in terms of 12 months. So that is it. 10 months will also be expressed in terms of 12 months. This one will also be expressed in terms of 12 months, in terms of 12 months. So that is what you see here. So 13 over 12, all right, multiply by 12. So you can actually scrap the entire thing and just put the 13 over there, all right? Because here and here will cancel out, 12 will cancel out. So the percentage that you have all over there, so you just slot in into the formula. So A, you that is what we are looking for. P, principal, which is the 20,000, the quarterly one, all right? So one, is one plus R, what is R? 125% this one, so 0 0.25, that is why we, N is the number of time it is compounding each year, uh, each each year, which is 12 times. So N again is 12 over here. Then T, this T, so is expressed over 12. Please remember that T is expressed over what? 12, all right, so that is that. So you do it like this. At the end of the day, this one will be the one standing. So when you work it out, you have A to be what? 26,000. If you now take the difference, A minus T, uh, you have interest of what? 6,135. Take note of that. Uh, you do same for all the quarters, except that, you see, as the quarter is drawing down, this time, 13 is also drawing down. So you, you just be deducting 3, 3, 3, because 3 is the quarter. Yeah. All right. So that is that. 
So you do same, only that the cotton figure changes. All right, so when you finish, you add all the interest up, then you get your final answer. All right, it's very easy, it's very easy. So like you do, Q1 will be what? We say A is equal to P into bracket one plus R all over N and T. T is always expressed what? Over 12. Okay. So if you take your first 20,000, it's over one plus 0 0.25, which you get by doing 125% of the statute. N is always 12, N is 12. T is expressed what? In 12 months, so 13 over 12. When 12 cancels 12, it will be 13 standing. All right, so take note of that. All right, it's very easy. Let's look at a more complicated example. Okay, look at this one. So Diaz, uh, uh, Luis Diaz prepares account January to December. Good for us to know each year. And the following is related to 2021. So we have what? We have the chargeable income, we have tax payable credits. This is the self-assessment. Uh, but the consultant of Diaz showed him that his actual tax payable is what uh, 800,000. So therefore, what is the correct amount? Correct amount, therefore, is the actual one, which is what 800,000. So 90% of this correct amount gives us what? 2.9 multiply by 800,000, which is 720,000. All right, then what? How, how much did he himself uh, decide to uh, file or disclose to the Commissioner General? He did 500,000, is that not it? That's what you see here. So in terms of finding these things out, so this is what you do. And you need to understand that. It says determine the quarterly instrument. Okay, so quarterly instruments, uh, we've learned that. So we will come to that. We come to that. So quarterly instrument, this was the chargeable. This was the amount. He has some task credit. We need to find the timing of this task credit. Okay, so that is what I think we've been doing. The task credit here, that's the breakdown. One, two, three, three, fifty. Do you remember how we do quarterly payment on self-assessment? Do, do you remember? All right, so if that is the case, let's hold on to this one first. All right, so let's, let's work the quarterly payment. So Q1, what will it be? Um, the tax payable is, the chargeable income is what? 2 million and CIT is 2.5. Uh, that should have been around 250,000, but we were given the tax payable over there. Uh, so it says, A, hey, do you remember this? All right. But remember, we ignore some things, and that is an important note that you have to get. So current tax is. Uh, uh, is five okay? The solution is here. So you see that uh, 500 minus zero because there is no installment in between. Um, yeah, and please, there is a note that I need you to take note of, it's very, very important. So you have 500, the tax payable is 500 which under normal circumstance we will divide by 12. So if you are doing Q1 payment, which ends in, uh, uh, what do you call it? It ends in uh, um, 30th, 31st March of the year. But you could see clearly that there is 100,000 paid. The note that I want to refer you to is, is here. And B, any payment which is not in the nature of withholding tax. Did you hear it? It's not in the nature of what? Withholding tax. 
in the current quarter is ignored. Is ignored. But as payment used in the subsequent quarter. This, this is a very, very important note that you need to gather. Do you remember we started doing that, but there were those figures that we were giving were withholding taxes, and that is where we, we withheld it. Any payment which is not in the form of what? Withholding tax. Remember when we were doing it, let me take you back. Uh, when we were doing self-assessment, those ones, uh -huh, you see, these ones were credits from withholding tax. That is why we deducted. But any payment in the form of withholding tax is ignored in the current year. So please take a very important note of that. Take a very, very important note of that. All right. So you could see clearly that this one, uh, this one, these are not credits. It came via cash payment. So if I am doing Q1, I'll do my 500. But even though this one is in Q1, because it is not withholding, all right, I will still do minus zero over four. And that gives me what? Uh, what, what, what is the figure? It's 125,000. Then in Q2, I can now bring that one. So that payment, so it will be, it will be 500 minus into bracket 125,000 plus, you see this, it's what, 100,000. All over all three, big note of that. And that is what I think, see here. All right, so that is what gives me. Okay, so when we go to Q3, then I'll do Q3, the same 500 minus what? 120, the figure that I have here. So 125,000 plus this 100,000, plus the figure that I have there, which is 133. So you have that, but is there any other payment? No, this payment was actually in what? July. So I think, so you just do that. Uh, um, so how much do we have here? Well, something wrong somewhere. There's something wrong somewhere. Oh, yes, correct. Because they never told us that this one was paid. This one is the payable amount. But as to whether it was paid, no. Assistance, the only one that we know they actually paid per quarter is this one. So they didn't pay. We could have just deducted it. All right, so that that is that. But care must be taken. Yes, so even this one, yeah, I think it skipped me. So since they didn't pay, but that's how we, we have the answer. Because they actually never go, went to pay this one. They didn't pay it. So, and in the earlier examples that we were doing, the question said that they paid on each quarter, if you check. So they actually pay on each quarter. All right, uh, so we started with the earlier example. Where is it? Yes, yeah, so it says that there was no revision and estimated task, no withholding. The entity makes payments on due date. And that is the assumption that ran through the same quick grammar question. So here too, the assumption is the payment on due date. Let me, let me add that. So please uh, take note of that. So they pay on due dates. All right. So it means that the calculated figures were paid on due dates. And that is why I could see clearly in this current example that the only payment they were making was the 100, 100,000. All right. So that is that. All right, so where are you? All right, so that is that. So the only payment they made was. And when we come to September, remember in the September, the, the Q3, they made payments. 
they actually made payment. But because it's payment and not in the form of withholding tax, do you see this? It will rather reflect in Q4. And in Q4, this 50 will not reflect because it's a payment. All right, so uh, are you getting it? So this is it. So in Q4, and that is why you see this 200,000. So if the payment that they made is not in the form of withholding tax, if they pay it in the current year, it won't reflect unless it goes into the following one. All right, take note, take a very important note of that one. Okay, so that is how we do it. And the B is talking about what I wanted to do earlier. Uh, so you see 800 is the correct amount, you do 90%. They filed a total of four, uh, estimate of 350. That is what they did. If you check the question, and that is what they did. All right, you. So this is a, a tax payable, but this is what they paid. This is what they paid for the quarter. So it means that they did the estimate should be 90% of this max, which we should collect from them, but this is what they ended up for us. So if we now compare the 350 to, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, the 90% the of the correct amount. Don't forget, this is, this is the tax uh, they, they assumed, but this is the money that they paid. So don't forget that. You can as well say 90% of the correct amount of the 800, you see, so this is it. And amount paid on self-assessment is that. All right, so this is the, the underpayment. And the underpayment is going to go through what? 12, if, uh, four equal installment, so you see. But you also realize that uh, what they did, this one, if they were to do correct amount of the correct amount in installment, this is what is going to be 180,000. So that is that. So now, therefore, what do you do? You pick the estimates of the correct amount they should have used. Be careful. Here, you see, we are not using the the difference. You are picking the correct amount of the estimate that they should have used because we are not uh, 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 focusing on the difference of what this one, this one. Our focus is here, quarterly installment, quarterly installment. So take very important note of that one. All right, so you will do so we had 720. All right, then you divide by four is correct, 180. So it means that every quarter, this is what they should be doing. This is what they should be doing. There are two ways of going by this anyway. Uh, so the first, this is the, this is it. So the one eighty, but because they paid some, you have to be deducting what they paid. All right. So this is it, and they paid hundred. They paid two hundred in Q three, and they paid. They overpaid. So what they overpaid will serve as a credit in the following one, and therefore they will not suffer any penalty here. So this is the instant that you do when there is cash payments. All right. So they are supposed to do this. They paid actually every quarter. They are supposed to pay this, but you found out that in the first quarter they paid this, second quarter they paid nothing, third quarter they paid two hundred thousand and excess. So it means that in this quarter there will be no penalty, but the second, the last quarter there will be penalty. So your your fee for the calculation is these ones, right? So that is what you do. So the interest calculation. So the same thing by your P is the difference. So when you have a situation where the payments are there like that, you use the quarter on the amount, the, the, the correct amount, then you'll be deducting the payments that were made. All right. So th that is the scenario that you have over here. So now, uh, when you do that, you go on and do the normal thing we do. All right. So all these ones, this one was given, it was 20%, so you find out. That is that. All right, so when it gets here, I think you don't have a big problem, all right? 
But let's look at a situation where they actually pay early, they file early. All right. Here, you see there is no payments, but there was a revision. There's no payment, there's a revision. All right. So PTS prepares the account here. And you see 2020 self-assessment was filed here, 100,000. They revised it to 120 on agent. According to the return PTS uh, limited filed on this. You see the deadline is what? 30th April. But here they filed on 31st March. So it won't be 13 months anymore. It will be how many months? 12 months. 12 months. Take note of that. 12 months. All right. So and the actual task payable is this. So in this case, and we don't have payments here, but we all know that uh, so correct amount is how much? 160,000, 90% of correct amount. And this is, you will use the revised, please take note. Use the revised. I said used what? The revised assessment. Because you cannot hold, the person recognize the mistake he did during the course of the year. Revised it, so you use the revised. And you see that even with the revised, there is a issue of how much? Uh, uh, 24,000. So uh, that is that is that is what. So now, again, the correct amount is broken into quarters. So do you see, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, 36,000 is broken into quarters, all right? So um, what, what then happens? The estimate, Q1, they did, so in terms of doing the quarterly estimated, Q1, this is what they used over four. Uh, and, and this also is assumed that they make payment on due dates. All right. All right, so that is that. So Q1, this is what they did. It, uh, it was after Q2, they amended. So this is it. So before Q3, you see it is 50-50, you have uh, 50,000. Then they change it here, then you see what happened here. And since they made payments, since the assumption is making payment, that is why we are not using uh, this one. We are actually using this one, why? Because when we do the division, we will subtract the payments that they made. So this one, for example, if you want the Q1, we will do that there. Because the payments were made, we will do that this one from this. All right. So Q2, the same. Q3 will be 1,000. Q4 will be 1,000. So let's see how the, yes, so this is it. And the payments were made. So this one becomes the basis for, you know, because the payments were made. All right. So. Please take note of that. And once, here is 12 months, why? Because they filed on 30th March. So from, from March, uh, uh, from April last year to March the following year is just 12 months. So that is what you do. Once, when it gets into the calculating, it, put it in your calculators and you find it out. So anytime there is a payment, please be reminded that you are taking the four quarterly installment from the correct amount, 90% of the correct amount, then you deduct the payments, all right, payments. All right, so take note of that, take note of that. Well, we have interest in failing to pay taxes. When you fail to uh, uh, pay the tax, you pay 125% of the statutory rate compounded monthly. And additionally, any extensions or suspensions granted are ignored in calculation of the interest. Finally, it specifies the withholding taxes and cannot recover interest from the person subject to the withholding tax. You took the money from somebody and you did not pay it. So you pay an interest of 125% compounded monthly like the way that we just did. All right, so that is that. So look at this issue of pedantic. So uh, Pedantic is a trading company and pay taxes 
uh, we pay taxes with help from supplier on 26th on March. How can you do that? How can you do that? So remember, filing is 500 CDs the first day that you didn't do, then 10 CDs each day. That is filing. And the payment that you didn't pay is also what? 125% of the statutory rate compounded monthly. So since he did it in May, and the thing should have actually been done in March 15th. Remember, reporting tasks are filed and paid on, on or before 15th of the ensuing month. And so what, what then happens? Remember, for penalty for not filing, 500 CDs first day, then 10 CDs each day you delay in the filing after the 500 CDs. So this was mainly because the sitting accountant resigned and the entity kept a junior officer. I, I constructed this thing myself. Because company like doing that. We took a newly appointed member of uh, CIT to discover that, and this involved an amount of 200,000. So due date of filing was 15th, which they didn't do. So if you count from that due date of filing, you see it was in 2020, and this one is when 2017. I need to correct this. So they pay tax withheld from supplier. This is the date, but this is when it happens. Um, uh, I need to correct something because uh, if the thing is May, it should be May 2019. Oh. How many days will surmount to? How many days is in a year? 365 days. Okay, so uh, this thing can be 2017 when this thing is 2020. So uh, we need to calculate well. So I, I think I need to correct something here. So bear with me, let me do the correction. All right, so that's it. So this thing is actually May 26th. All right, May 26th. So um, they were supposed to actually file in March 15th, but they didn't. And so, and the payment too didn't go. So as for when it comes to the penalty, the first day they did not file, which is March 16th, will be 500 cities. Then from March 16th to May 26th, the following year is 435 days. All right, so together with this one makes 436 days. So that one is 10 CDs a day. So this that is the amount here. Okay, that is the penalty. So penalty is for not filing is 500 CDs the, the day and that it elapsed. So in this case, when we get to March 15th, we've not filed, so 500 CDs. Then 10 days every day from that day go, all right. And so it's very important to file, very, very important to personal income tax, whatever it is. That is why every year I have to be fast and file. Because if you don't do it, the day you do it, the penalty will be calculated automatically on your platform. All right. Unless there is an amnesty. Then uh, the interest too is because you didn't pay the money, the amount, uh, you take 125% of the statutory rate. And and, and also charge. You see, it's 465 days expressed over 12 months, which is 365 days. Since this one is this, this one is this. Multiply by 12 months. And that one alone gives you uh, this. Well, when you did that, this is the money. So you are going to pay this interest and pay this penalty. All right. And these are the ones that the, the Commissioner General can help you. So the same illustration, uh, this, this is it. Don't forget, penalty is what? 500 CDs the first day, 10 CDs every day that you don't file. So filing, failing to keep proper books of account too is a, a penalty of 75% of the tax code if the failure is deliberate or the lesser or the lesser of the amount and 250 currency points if not del deliberate. Okay, so that is it. So the penalty is either 75% of the task code if it, is, it was deliberate 
or the lesser of uh, that amount and what 250 so if it is not deliberate so what we are saying is that if you fail to keep books deliberately you have what 75 percent of the tax owed that is the penalty that doesn't mean you will not pay the, that hundred percent that is resistant so you pay 75 percent all right so or lesser of uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, 250 RC point. Okay, so that, that is that. The lesser of, uh, what do you call it? The, the tax amount, the amount. So 250 currency points or the lesser of 200 or what we call this place, that amount. All right, so that is when it is not deliberate. That is when it's not deliberate, all right. So if it is deliberate, 75%. Failing to fill uh, file tax, that is what we discussed, is 500 CDs. But if it is a communication service, that is 200 CDs the first day and 500 CDs each day. But if it is any other than CST, it is 500 CDs the first day of default, then last additional 10 CDs each day. If it is CST, 2,000 first day, like MTM people, 500 cities each day. All right. So, you know, if you multiply this 500 cities by 30 days, how much is that? I think it's 15,000. So if you don't employ the correct person to be doing, that's why in these kind of companies, they have a tax department. Because the penalty of this is big, it's big. And even this one that is 500, then 10 CDs times 30 is what, 300. So even this one, you are paying like 800 CDs first month. So the first month, that is what you are going to do. And it's going to continue. So hire the correct people. Uh, uh, making false, uh, false, or misleading statement. If you are in that person, your penalty is 100% of the shortfall uh, without reasonable excuse, but 30% uh, uh, with any other case if you have a reasonable excuse. The penalty is cumulative uh, increase if you don't do the correct things in five years for the last, within the last five years, all right? But uh, it's increased, but also reduced if you disclose before the discovery is made. So please, uh, you can disclose early and you'll be safe. But if the thing, it's, I mean, uh, it, it, we said that the penalty is cumulatively increased 20% each subsequent application within the last five years, but it is reduced if the error is voluntarily disclosed. So it's better you, you, so the last five years is to be increased in 20%, 20%, 20%. All right, so that is that, that is that. All these places are not that much examinable than the initial stage, all right? So if you if you fit yourself to correct, uh, collect tax payments, you pay 200% of the amount that you collected, all right? Yes, the penalty is cumulatively increased 20% for each subsequent application within the last also five years. So that is that, aiding and abatement. A person who knowingly aid or abet, okay, if that if, if if you are also that you pay hundred percent of that shortfall, all right. So take note of that. But the key ones that you are supposed to take note is the ones at the top. Let's just do close this class with a short uh, issues on tax planning. Tax planning is anything that you do to reduce your tax payment. All right, take note of that. And at the level two, we talk about the elements. So what are some of the things you do? It's either you, you defer the tax liability uh, uh, without increasing your, your interest. How do you do that? Remember, we said you can file for your extension. And how does that amount to tax, tax plan? If you file for an extension, you can synchronize your, and gather your cash flow, or you can invest the money in that short period 
all right? And you earn some interest so that you can also pay the tax liability with the interest with that software. Number two, ability to change the location of an income. Of course, if you are in Accra, the mine is 25%, and in Kaswa, it is 18.5%. All other things be equal. Why don't you shift to Kaswa? Because it's also close to Accra anyway. And be, rather than being in the mine, your market is in Accra. So, I mean, those are the things that you, you take note. So you change the location to Kaswa, you pay 18.75. So the location. Ability to change the character of an income. Of course, money in the hands of the church is called offering. It is not taxable. Money in the hands of a businessman is called profit. It is taxable. In the hands of an NGO, we call it a charity or a donation. It's also not taxable. So if you change the character of the income, that is true. Uh, to transfer from a lower tax jurisdiction or a higher tax jurisdiction to a lower tax jurisdiction. Also changing a way of changing uh, uh, or finding a way to reduce your tax liability, which we also call tax planning. All right, so that is that. Okay, now let's look at the variables or the concepts of tax planning. Let's look at some concepts. Uh, we talk about tax avoidance. It's avoiding the tax. I mean, you are avoiding it. You are you are not finding a way to not to pay the tax. Well, it is called bending the rules, not breaking the rules. All right, you are exploiting the loopholes in the tax law to get you to pay lower taxes. In fact, if you read section 34 of the 8th it says tax avoidance include any arrangement. The main purpose is to, uh, which the main purpose is to reduce your tax liability. All right. So if you engage in that, it is a tax avoidance. All right. So, but tax uh, evasion is when you use criminal ways. That one is called breaking the rules. You are using unjust means to uh, not to pay tax. Plato says that when there is, where there is income tax, the just man will pay more and the unjust man will pay less on the same amount. I mean, how do they do that? So if you keep two books, people do that. One for GRE, one for banks. Doing extra job for cash, cash transaction. Barter trade, you are not giving the value. If I exchange the calculator for a phone, I mean, what are the values? So cash transaction, non-disclosure, forcing of books, and the maxims of tax planning are, uh, we talk about uh, the location variable, activity variable, time variable. What is the location variable? So where you locate yourself, like the Kaswa manufacturing company in Kaswa, and also be in the free zone. You know free zone don't pay income tax for how many years? 10 years. 10 years. And after the 10 years, any uh, chargeable income that they earn on export is taxed at 15%. Then the local one, I hear this one, I see 25%. But, but the reason why I keep this 25%, unless the law has been amended, which I'm not getting it, uh, watch this. So it is actually coming from the law that I have. Uh, which was amended. Uh, so, um, and so I would really need the extension, uh, maybe any uh, amendment to foster that because I have searched and searched, probably my search hasn't gone far enough. So uh, that is that. But if you look at, uh, so if you do, this is the law, the act, and let's do free zone and go to paragraph three of the first schedule. Ah, it brought me straight here. Now we know, know that in the free zone act, it is 8% that is stated there. But look at the income tax act. It says that the chargeable income of a company other than a company principally engaged in hotel, which we know is 22%, and income from goods and services provided in the domestic market. All the others are taxed at 25%. So other than, so we can't say free zone is part of the 25%, unless the, the so you see the hotel, which is uh, um, eight, uh, 22%. Yes, so, uh, 
unless the free zone has been amended and I have not seen it, it still stands as the 8% that is in the free zones act. All right, because this one, it says other than hotels and what? Those from domestic of uh, free zone after their concession of 10 years. All the others are 25%. So that is the reason why I kept there. But anyway, I still look for the amendments to, to see if there is any question. Because I see in books um, 25%. But I would want to see myself changing. All right. So that is that. Then manufacturing is spoken about it. Okay. Yeah. And if you are in farming, uh, the rate is that if you are in Accra Tema, it's 20% outside the regional, uh, uh, sorry, regional capital outside the northern Savannah ecological zone, any other place. All right, then in the regional ecological zone itself is 5%. So take note of that. Take note of that. All right. But if you are 35 years and you are a young entrepreneur, you know you don't pay tax for five years. If you are in horticulture, medicinal plant, tourism, waste processing, energy, agro processing. I, I, for me, please, the information technology means you are developing softwares, not like you're operating like businesses like MTN. It's developing of softwares. So that one, you have exemption for five years. After your five years is over, we look for, so this is it, exemption for a period of five years. All right. Then after, the, after that five years, if you are in Accra Tema, your rate, is 15 outside the three, uh, outside the three northern regions, 25. Within the northern region is five, uh, outside other regional capital, so 20%. Activity variable, the things you do, all right? You have concession of 1% for, uh, what do we call it, three crops, and it start from commencing the year of your first harvest, then five years, year of commencement of business for 1% in farming livestock. Cattle is 10 years by commence from business commencing. All right. So that is that. Then the time variable, like the amnesty that happened. If you use the amnesty, it, it comes and go. The forgiveness of tax debt uh, for uh, 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 what we call regretful tax defaulters. Uh, remorseful one, two, is what we call, the, the, they, they have the feeling that, oh, we are sorry, but you forgive them, even as they pay the main tax, forgive them of the penalty. And it came, it ended in 2021, and it's gone. So um, it was reintroduced. So it actually ended in 2022. It, the first time it was introduced in Ghana was in 2017, and 2021, too, it was reintroduced because of COVID and Stuff. The entity variable, we know we have these entities. So we have individuals, partnership, company, and trust. All right. So just the gist of tax planning. The main one of it is Nani. Uh, uh, three. All right. So that, that is that. After that, you move into your past questions. You see the things that we have discussed. What is self-assessment? You know, self-assessment. When you yourself, you do the assessment. You know it, right? Critical benefit of self-assessment to the taxpayer for claiming of reliefs, but with what uh, 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 input? Yes, to the GRA what they get the information they need. They know uh, more information about the taxpayer. Uh, for the individual, you see that it's for your relief, your capital allowance, your uh, allowable deductions. All right. Then we talk this one. Uh, it says that discuss how the issue should be handled. What issue? The Commissioner General issued a private ruling which conflicts with all the intents and purposes of existing practice notes issued by 
uh, the Commissioner General himself. You see, private ruling takes precedence over practice note because private ruling is when I went to him personally. So if it is conflicting with the, the so it is binding on the Commissioner General to the extent of the information that you gave him. All right, so private ruling takes precedence over practice note. So because you went to him, that one is the two of you. All right, it's the two of you. So that, that is that. Okay, so take important note of that. Discuss the issue, how the issue be, should be handled. So uh, if he issued and you know that you gave, you gave the correct information to the Commissioner General, then uh, we all know that these things are binding on the Commissioner General. All right, explain provisional assessment and self-assessment. So self-assessment is the opposite of provisional assessment, only that the provisional assessment is done by GRA, Commissioner General, Self-assessment is done by the taxpayer. All right, so that is the rationale. Discuss the rationale of shifting from provisional assessment to self-assessment. That is voluntary compliance. All right, voluntary compliance. So we'll talk about voluntary compliance. The fact that GRA wants the uh, taxpayers to comply voluntarily. All right, so that, I mean, we, we, we feel the responsibility of being part of governance. All right, so we are rather Using, and they use the deterrent factor, all right? So we comply. That is why they are shifting from provisional assessment to self-assessment. Uh, this one too talks about tax reforms, and it says that discuss the governance structure of the GRA, that is the board, all right, the board. You know the nine members of the board, the chairperson of CEO, one person from Bank of Ghana, not below the rank of deputy governor. Ministry of Finance, not below the rank of a director. Ministry of Trade and Industries, not below the rank of a director. Then four people from the private sector, uh, I mean, two of whom should be women. You know that. Uh, this one to discusses the procedure for submission. I indicate the procedure for submission of return and uh, payment of taxes, uh, any penalty. So you read the the issue. If it is CST, you know the timing that they should file. Uh, CST, okay. You should know the timing that they should file, and also know about the penalty, the sanctions. Two thousand cities the first day, then five hundred cities each day. Final. Then dispute resolution. You remember. You remember that. You, you you object within 30 days of the receipt in the notice. You buy, you can file for extension of that 30 days. Before the, that, you don't wait to let the 30 days expire before you file for extension. You do it before the expiry of the 30 days. All right. And don't forget that there is, if it is uh, import duty and taxes, you have to pay all your outstanding, including 100% of the amount that you are objecting. But any other ones, you pay all your outstanding, including just 30% of the amount that you're objecting. All right, so that is that. And after that, the Commissioner General, we all know that the Commissioner General can waive those conditions, vary it or suspend it. But he has to make his decision to you within 60 days as to whether he's accepting your objection or, or, or not accepting your objection. Accepting in the way of varying the amount or withdrawing in hold um, all right, but he has to report to you in 60 days. We all know that uh, if uh, in 60 days you don't hear from him, you can elect to treat his silence as uh, not setting your objection. Then you go to the uh, tax appeals board, all right? Then from the tax appeals board, you can go to the high courts, all right? It, it, sorry, the, the appeals board decision equates that of a high court. So probably you can go to a higher court. All right, so, um, and this one says functions of the GRA. I mean, uh, we've, that's what we started with. Just to let you see the kind of question that drops. All right, so what is a class ruling, class action? A class private uh, decision. Explain the role played by Ghana revenue in management of the economy. Ah, they do tax administration, and you know the elements of tax administration. 
All right. This one it says recommend three factors that are necessary to ensure voluntary compliance. Uh, we know that voluntary compliance, self-assessment is a key. Education, you have to educate the people and you also have to also use deterrent factors, interest and penalties. All right. So self-assessment, interest and penalties, tax education, you have to educate the people. All right. So what is the purpose of segmentation to this effect? I told you this thing is, is gone. It's gone. We don't do this thing. So don't expect uh, these questions and the L2, M2, and the questions. All right. This question says, under what circumstance would you encourage the running of the state enterprise as a business entity by government to increase government revenue as against imposition of new tax of the same for, for the same purpose? Uh, these things are, are really political issues. Okay, they are really political. Of course, when you run, uh, uh, I mean, government entity, as uh, of state as business entities but it says some political analyst has often made the claim that governments over the world should create enabling environment for private businesses to flourish including granting incentives as a way of creating jobs for the unemployed youth and that government should directly should not directly engage in businesses they sum this up with the statement that government has no business doing business. <laughs> Others, however, had, you know, no, no, the government has to do business. Doing business also means that they are, I mean, uh, also creating employment. And if they create employment, pay will come. All right. So people will pay tax out of their salary. So it's not like government should not do business. Government should do business. What are the elements of notice? Uh -huh. I showed you the elements of notice of assessment. The return form, the things that are on it. Uh, if they are serving you a letter of notice, your name should be there, your address should be there, your thing should be there. The amount they are saying you should be paying should be there. I mean, the signature, the letterhead details of the of the commissioner general should all be on the form. You can mention more than 10. All right. And this one is about what? It says calculate the oh, I think we've done this one already. That is the one I used as the example. All right, so we go through these things and uh, spend time, go through your past. Uh -huh. So this one is, a, what do you call it? Uh, Kamar Shometh, uh, this is this issue. Customs, uh, VAT, uh, additional information, 50% of relates to import. Uh, you know that it says that the above came about from adjusted ass assessment. So what is the question? What condition must be for, of course, if it is custom, then don't forget he has to pay his all outstanding taxes, all of this, all of them, all of them. But if it is not uh, import, then it means that he has to pay everything, then 30% of the one that is subjected. So you, that is that, what constitutes a tax return? Is, that is the form that has the information. So all these are the questions that you see I think they, they they keep coming every year and every year and every year. So you have to be very, very careful, all right? So um, uh, in a face-to-face -face class, we solve these things uh, in class. We actually do all this calculation. So if you want to join us uh, in a face-to-face -face class, uh, we are located in Tema. Uh, it is uh, it's Tema Accountancy Center at community 11, uh, just under the traffic light at the uh, Meta Senior High School. All right, so I will leave my contact. So if you want to join this, uh, join us wherever you are. So this is my contact. All right, so, and the name is, and St. Thomas. So contact me anytime. Uh, we'll give you directions to 
uh, uh, accountancy. You can also call me if you are only restricted to online, you are not in Tema, Prof Training Solutions, you will handle it well. All right, so we have a general online class. That one is with Prof Training Solutions. Then the face-to-face -face class is Tema Accountancy, Solution, uh, Accountancy Center here in Tema. All right, so thank you. Spend time, watch the video, get yourself prepared for your exam. I trust that you follow this suit and I know you will get the highest mark in tax if you follow it. Thank you. See you in our next lecture of gift tax and withholding tax. All right. Bye-bye.